This session is entitled Dangerous Doctrines. Uh, this session we'll be looking at the metaphysical cultic origins of the movement and the standard doctrines which the faith preachers espouse that deviate from Orthodox Christianity. So where did the Word of Faith movement begin? Well, it began with a man named Phineas Parkhurst Quimby. Quimby was the father of New Thought, a metaphysical cult. Now let me define a couple of terms here for us. When I say metaphysical, I know that's a big $3 word, but really all metaphysical means is beyond the physical realm, beyond what we can see. And when I say cult, you might have images of people dressed in black robes, wearing a black hood, standing around a pentagram, worshiping Satan. That would qualify, but that's not what we mean here by cult. A, a quote-unquote Christian cult is any group or sect that calls itself Christian and yet they deny some of the fundamental doctrines of the faith. Uh, Jehovah's Witnesses belong to a cult. Mormonism is a cult because they compromise, deny some of the fundamentals of our faith. So Quimby, the great-grandfather of the Word of Faith movement, was the father of the metaphysical cult known as New Thought. He was also a student of occultism, hypnosis, and parapsychology. And I believe that much of the behavior that we'll look at in the next session, mangled manifestations, can be attributed to some of these disciplines. His theoretical formulation served as the basis for the mind science cult, also known as Christian science, which was founded properly by Mary Baker Eddy, and his theoretical formulations later served as a basis for the theology of the modern Word of Faith movement. So Quimby is the one that first began to articulate some of the doctrines that we see today. Essek W. Kenyon is the grandfather of the Word of Faith movement. Uh, Kenyon is recognized by all your modern prosperity preachers as uh, the grandfather of this movement. They would all appeal to Kenyon. And I've been in Kenneth Copeland's bookstore before. You can look in there and there's Essek Kenyon material all over the shelves. And uh, Kenyon himself had very clear ties to the metaphysical cults, particularly New Age and New Thought. He was heavily influenced by them. He attended college at the Emerson School of Oratory where the metaphysical cults were prominent and they flourished. Now I want us to look at a few of the doctrines that Kenyon taught. Number one, Kenyon taught that God created not ex nihilo as we call it, not out of nothing, but rather God created by speaking faith-filled words. And we as believers can do the same thing. Kenyon held essentially that faith was a tangible substance and when God spoke, his words were containers of the substance called faith. Almost like Tupperware containers that carried the substance of faith. So his words of faith is what created the worlds and everything that we see. And we as believers can use our own words of faith to speak things into existence to create our own physical reality. Kenyon held that humans took on the nature of Satan in the fall. When this happened, they forfeited to Satan their supposed deity and made Satan the legal god of planet Earth. Kenyon held that Jesus died not only a physical death, but he also died a spiritual death, where Jesus suffered was tormented in hell, died spiritually, and had to be reborn. And that is where the real atonement of our sins took place, not on the cross, but in hell. And finally, Kenyon held that health and wealth are obtainable by the believer's positive confession. So if we need money, we can speak it into existence. If we need healing, we can speak it into existence. Kenyon did hold to many of the fundamental doctrines of Orthodox Christianity. However, what's happened in the modern Word of Faith movement is that your modern prosperity preachers like Benny Hinn and Kenneth Copeland have taken Kenyon's mistakes and made them much worse. So compared to your modern prosperity preachers, Essek W. Kenyon was actually fairly orthodox. Some of you may remember this gentleman. William Branham was the father of the post-World War II healing revival movement. Branham is the one that first began to popularize some of these tent healing meetings. Let's look at some of his doctrines. Branham taught that only those who accepted his teachings would be saved. So if you disagreed with William Branham, then you were just out of luck. Branham held that Eve had relations with the serpent in the Garden of Eden. Branham thought very highly of himself. He proclaimed himself to be the angel of Revelation chapter 3, verse 14. He just read himself right into scripture. And Paul Crouch, founder and president of TVN a few years ago, did the very same thing. Paul Crouch said, said that he found his name hidden in an Old Testament Bible code using equidistant lettering. So Paul Crouch reads himself right into God's Word too. Branham prophesied that all of the world's denominations would be consumed by the Roman Catholic controlled World Council of Churches. And Branham said that this would happen in 1977, just before the rapture and the destruction of the world. Well, guess what didn't happen? And finally, Branham 
taught that the doctrine of the Trinity was a demonic doctrine. Listen to the following audio clip of William Branham and then listen to Benny Hinn's endorsement of him. Now, my precious brother, I know this is a tape also. Now, don't get excited. Let me say this with godly love. The hours approach where I can't hold still on these things no more. It's too close to the see? Trinitarianism is of the devil. I say that, thus say it the Lord. God uses normal individuals. Whether it's Smith Wigglesworth or Catherine Kuhlman or Amy or A. Allen or William Branham, great men of God. There you just heard Benny Hinn, one of the most widely recognized individuals, leaders in Christianity today, call William Branham a great man of God. This is a man who denounced the Trinity as a demonic doctrine. There's an astonishing lack of discernment in our churches today. And William Branham died, as you see, in 1965. He had prophesied that he would be raised from the dead when he did die, and believe it or not, to this very day, uh, in, at Branham's tomb place, they'll, uh, there's a small group of Branhamites that will gather every Easter Sunday morning around his tomb waiting for that old boy to come back up. And uh, I think they'll be waiting for quite a while. Kenneth Hagin is the father of the modern Word of Faith movement. And uh, though Kenneth Hagin claimed that no believer should die before age 120, you see that he died here at age 86. Now, Kenneth Hagin, like almost all of the Word of Faith preachers, claim that much of what they teach you, they receive directly from divine revelation knowledge from Jesus himself. And this is almost like their fallback position and their way of insulating themselves from any biblical criticism. And they'll say essentially that, well, if you can't find what I'm teaching you in the Word, don't worry about it, you see, because I have it from the highest authority. Jesus himself came and gave me these teachings. And um, Kenneth Hagin claimed to have received eight personal visitations from Christ. And in one of these visitations, Jesus supposedly gave him the following teaching. Um, this deals with what we'll look at in a little bit called the spiritual death of Jesus. But Hagin claimed that he received these words directly from Jesus himself. It's interesting, however, that Jesus bears a striking resemblance to Essex W. Kenyon. If you can see here, it's practically word for word identical. Hagen did not receive this from Jesus. Hagen plagiarized Essex W. Kenyon. And this is just all I could fit on the screen, but this information is quite voluminous. It goes on and on and on. Uh, Hagen did not receive this from Christ. He plagiarized Kenyon. And yet, listen to the following audio clip of Gloria Copeland perpetuating this myth. You say, why do y'all talk so much about Kenneth Hagin when you do this? Because he's where we learned how to walk in the Spirit, how we learned what we learned. How did he know it? He had the very unusual experience of Jesus himself coming to teach him these things, and then he called him to teach all of us. And so that's why, and that's where we learned it. It'll be a blessing to you. The faith preachers are very fond of claiming divine origin for what they teach, yet you can see the origins of their teachings are not nearly so supernatural. Kenneth Copeland is without a doubt one of the most intelligent and articulate proponents of word faith theology, but as we shall see as we go along today, he is also very, very dark. And this man probably needs no introduction, Benny Hinn, uh, the world's greatest quote-unquote faith healer in all the world today. Two of the leading lights in word faith theology. I want to show you this quote now from Essek Kenyon, dealing with occultic origins. Kenyon writes, we cannot ignore the amazing growth of Christian science, unity, new thought, spiritism. We cannot close our eyes to the fact that in many of our cities on the Pacific Coast, Mrs. Eddy has a stronger following today and a larger attendance at her churches than have the old line denominations. The people have left them because they believe they are receiving more help from Mrs. Eddy's teaching than from preachers. They will tell you how they were healed and how they were helped in their spiritual life by this strange cult. So by his own admission, Kenyon believed that these metaphysical cults had really tapped into some power. Now he wanted to, and I really think in a good faith effort, he wanted to try to, to take some of these cultic doctrines and, and teach them as truth, but he, he just believed that these cults had tapped into some power and we as Christians can have that same power. And so he tried to Christianize some of these cultic doctrines and that remains true to this day. Now let's look at some of the standard doctrines which the faith preachers teach. We will begin with the doctrine of positive confession. Uh, consider these clips as illustrative of this teaching. Look at me, say, 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 all, all of you, say, there's power in me, power in me. To, speak life and death. to speak life and death. You call what you have 
You say what you want. And I'm here to tell you, I know that I know that I know that as these programs are airing, I I'm speaking something into existence. Amen. I'm speaking something into existence. If that sounds eerily like God's act of creation in Genesis 1 and 2, that's because it is. Dear friends, only God can speak things into existence. That is not an ability that you and I have. And we'll see as we go along that one of the fundamental problems of the faith movement is that the faith preachers blur what should be a very crisp line of distinction between God the Creator and us His created. They demote God to make Him look more human than what He is, and then they deify man to make us look a lot more like God than what we really are. Consider this from Gloria Copeland. Don't see yourself uh, pitiful, depressed, without, broke. Get into the Word. If you're having pro uh, financial problems, get into the Word until you see yourself prosperous. We saw ourselves prosperous before we got prosperous. Now, you may have seen that and you're wondering, well, Justin, what's so bad about that? She's just talking about having a positive outlook on life. No, it's something a bit more serious than that. What she's talking about is something known as visualization. And visualization is a new age technique in which you visualize things with your mind. And when you visualize these things in your mind, they will then become physical reality. And this, by the way, is very, very similar to what Oprah Winfrey is teaching in this thing called The Secret. You've heard about Oprah Winfrey promoting The Secret, see a lot of nodding heads. Same kind of thing. Uh, and it, it, These cultic ideas will pop up in different places. They'll pop up in Oprah Winfrey and The Secret, and they'll pop up in Word of Faith and, and the contemplative prayer movement, the emergent movement, and it just, it's the same basic heresy. It just rears its head in, in different places. Uh, to further flesh this out from Gloria Copeland, uh, this quotation from her husband, Kenneth Copeland. Kenneth Copeland says, when you get to the place where you take the Word of God and you build an image on the inside of you of not having crippled legs, not having blind eyes, but when you close your eyes, you just see yourself leap out of that wheelchair, it will picture that in the Holy of Holies, and you will come out of there. You will come out. So, according to Kenneth Copeland, all I need to do is sit up here and close my eyes and think real hard and imagine myself not having cerebral palsy, not having my crutches, and when I concentrate hard enough, that image will materialize in the Holy of Holies, and then I'll just open my eyes and be healed. Friends, that is foreign to the Word of God. That is foreign to the Word of God. It's right at home in the metaphysical cults, but foreign to God's Word. This from Benny Hinn. Benny Hinn said this on TBN one day. He said, I had a witch tell me this. Now, there's his first problem. <laughs> there's his first problem. Benny Hinn is learning spiritual truths, not from the Bible under the direction of leadership of the Holy Spirit, but from a witch. She said, you know that we are taught in witchcraft how to kill birds with words and how to kill people with our mouth. We were taught with words to bring disease on men by speaking words that would defeat them. She said, with words, I used to kill birds. I used to kill birds. She said she would speak to a bird and the bird would drop dead. I said, dear God, I didn't know the devil had such power. And the Lord spoke to me, notice the source of his authority, and he said, the devil can kill with words, then you with your words can bring life. And it just come and clicked inside of me, brother, and we Christians don't realize the power in our mouths. Dear friends, only God can bring life with the words that he speaks. That is not something that you and I can do. Only God can do that. This from T.D. Jakes. T.D. Jakes says, that word of God is how God procreates. It's how God regenerates. I didn't know God was decaying. And that's why once you get in the word of God, you've got to be careful what you speak to because the power of life and death is in your tongue. Is this true? Is there any scriptural support that the power of life and death is in our tongue? Well, upon first consideration, it might would seem so. Faith preachers would all appeal to Proverbs 18.21, which says, Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Well, it doesn't say right there that the power of life and death is in our tongue. Well, not exactly. Let's, let's be good Bereans, search the scriptures to see if these things are really so. As is common with the faith preachers, they only want to quote to you part of a verse, or if they quote the whole verse, they'll take it out of its context. And that's what's happening here. Let's look at Proverbs 18.21 in its entirety. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. So when you look at this verse in its entirety, it doesn't exactly say what the faith preachers claim it does. In fact, I want you to read uh, what Alan P. Ross says about this verse in the Expositor's Bible Commentary. He says, those who enjoy talking, in other words, indulging in it, must bear its fruit, whether good or bad. The lesson is to be warned, especially if you love to talk. You see, dear friends, this verse is not saying that we have the power of life and death. In our, like, we can't, it's not saying we can speak life into existence. This is a warning to us. So, in other words, if you're one of those people that likes to uh, talk a little bit too much, you like to gossip, 
indulge in gossip, uh, you better be ready to bear the consequences of it. This is not saying we can speak life and death. This is a warning. It is a caution. Consider these clips. Turns the containers for power. They carry creative or destructive power, positive or negative power. And so we need to be speaking right things over our lives and about our futures if we expect to have good things happen. Because what you say today is what you'll probably end up having tomorrow. Speak with your mouth what you believe in your heart. You'll have whatever you say. We don't have to pray for your will, Lord. And that same Holy Spirit wants to send spiritual light to a darkened world today. But he's waiting for you and me to say, oh, that spoken word is the key. Speak that thing. Decree that thing. And it shall come to pass. Whatever it is in your life that you're decreeing right now. As we speak a thing together, it intensifies it. it. As John says, it supercharges it. You've got to say it. You've got to speak it. You've got to s decree it. You decree the thing. You pay your vow. And then. He brings it to pass. It's in the Word. It's all through the book. What do you need? I need money. Then start creating it. Start speaking about it. Start speaking it into being. Speak to your billfold. Say, you big, thick billfold full of money. Speak to your checkbook. Say, you checkbook, you've never been so prosperous since I owned you. You're just jammed full of money. You've got pain and disease in your body. Speak to your body. God will create the fruit of your lips. Say to your body, your whole body. Why, you just function so beautifully and so well. Why, body, you never have any problems. You're a strong, healthy body. Or speak to your leg, or speak to your foot, or speak to your neck, or speak to your back. And once you have spoken, believe that you've received, and don't go back on it. Speak to your wife, speak to your husband, speak to your circumstances, and speak faith to them, to pray to them, and God will create what you're speaking. So, according to Marilyn Hickey, next time you find yourself a little low in cash, don't worry about it, just reach into your pocket. Back pocket, pull out your wallet, and start talking to it. Y'all be sure and let me know how that works out for you. Well, what if this doctrine that faith is a substance that we can manipulate is? Is there any truth to this? Is there any scriptural support? Well, on first consideration, it might would seem so. Hebrews 11.1, 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Well, it doesn't say right there that faith is a substance. Well. We'll come back to this verse, but first I want you to listen to this audio clip of Kenneth Copeland and Paul Crouch. Well, the force of faith is, in the spiritual realm, a great deal like certain forces in the natural realm. It's a spiritual force, like gravity is a natural force, electricity is a mm. natural force of power. It's mm -hmm. a powerful thing. A measurable natural yeah, force. It's a measurable uh, mm -hmm. force. It's conductible, perceptible to the touch. Uh, faith is a spiritual force. It's perceptible. It's uh, it is a tangible force. It's an invisible force. So is gravity, mm -hmm. but it's there. So is electricity. So according to Keith Copeland, faith is a physical, tangible force. Well, let's go back to Hebrews 11:1. 1, but this time I want us to look at it in the New American Standard translation. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. A little bit different take on Hebrews 11.1, 1, is it not? Well, the word in question here that the King James renders as substance and the New American Standard renders as assurance in the Greek is the word hypostasis. And the word hypostasis literally means assurance. That's what that word means. It does not mean a physical, tangible substance. Now, am I saying that the King James is wrong? Nope, that's not what I'm saying at all. Uh, the King James isn't wrong, it's just that English has evolved quite a bit in the last 400 years. Somebody reading the King James rendering of that 400 years ago would have understood perfectly well what the intent was. But our language has just changed. That word has a different connotation today than it did back then. So the word literally means assurance. It does not mean a physical, tangible substance. Consider this audio clip of Kenneth Copeland and Paul and Jan Crouch. Does God use faith? Surely. Now, now see, here's the sore spot. There are those not with who him. say? No, not, not with you. No, no, no. <laughs> not with I'm the fact I'm not sore at God at all. And I don't think he's sore at me. I don't know. I haven't done anything to him. No, but the, the critics say God is God. He doesn't have to have faith. He doesn't exercise faith. He doesn't use faith. He's God. He's the object of faith. Oh, wait a minute. What does that mean? I don't know what that means. I don't know. <laughs> Kenneth Copeland said, no, wait a minute. What's that mean? God's the object of our faith. I don't know what that means. And then you hear Jan Crouch say, I don't either. 
Friends, that's not meat. That's milk. The fact that God is the object of our faith, that's first grade Sunday school stuff. And it's astonishing to me that these people who claim to be some of our leaders don't understand the elementary truth that God is the object of our faith. Because you see, in their system, he's not the object of faith. Faith is the object of faith. You see, in word faith theology, faith is not placed in God. Faith is a force that you direct at God to make him do what you want him to do. And it's rather ironic when you think about it that these people who call themselves faith preachers have a fundamental misunderstanding of what faith actually is. The following video clip is one of the more bizarre clips I've ever come across dealing with the doctrine of positive confession. This from Gloria Copeland. You know, you're, the, you're supposed to control the weather. I mean, Ken's the primary weatherman at our house, but when he's not there, I do it. He can see what's happening out there. It shows just like they have on at the weather, like on the news. I mean, he's got the computers, got the current weather on it and all that for flying. So uh, sometimes I'll hear something. I'll hear the thunder start. Maybe he'll still be asleep. And I say, Ken, you need to do something about this. <laughs> and knowing that, but you are the one that has authority over the weather. One day, Ken and Pat Boone, we were in Hawaii at their house, and we were, they were sitting outside, and there was a weather spout out over the ocean. And that's like a tornado, except it hits the water. And so they were sitting there, and they just watched it, rebuked it, it never did anything. One day, I was in the airplane in the back, and my little brother was in the back with me, and Ken was up front flying, and we were not in the weather, because we don't fly bad weather, but we, we could see the weather over here. And I looked out the window, and that tornado came down just like this, down toward the ground and Ken said I rebuke you in the name of Jesus you get back up there so this is how I learned how to talk to tornadoes I saw this and that tornado went woo, 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 woo. even while I was watching and my little brother was not a devout Christian at that time and that was really good for him to see so you're the weatherman you get out there or the weather woman whichever it is and you talk to that thing and you tell it you're not coming here I command you to dissipate and you get back up there in Jesus name Glory to God. That, that, I won't charge you extra. That almost doesn't even really deserve a comment, but I will offer one briefly. If it is true, and that's a huge if, but if it is true that Gloria Copeland can control the weather by the words that she speaks, then I would submit to you that Gloria Copeland is one of the most wretched people alive on the face of the earth today. Might we ask where she was when a little storm named Hurricane Katrina rolled into town? Might we ask where she was just a couple weeks ago when Hurricane Ike rolled in? Why does she not right now get on her brand new $25 million private jet and fly to some of these drought-stricken countries in Eastern Africa and talk those starving people up some rain? This is what is being portrayed as Christian. And let us remember that what much of the world believes about Christianity, it gets from Christian television. And this is what it's seen. Speaking to storms and making them go away, does it remind you of someone else who one day was in a boat with his disciples and a storm came up and he spoke to the storm and calmed it? Sound familiar? You see what the faith preachers are doing. They are blurring that line between God the Creator and us His created. For a little bit different take on the account of Jesus speaking to storms and making them go away, this from Joel Osteen. One time Jesus was on a boat asleep and all of a sudden, this huge storm arose. The winds were so strong, they were batting the boat back and forth. And the disciples got all upset and all afraid. They finally ran back there, said, Jesus, get up. We're about to die. We're about to perish. And Jesus got up, and he simply spoke to the storm. He said, peace, be still. And all of a sudden, there was a great calm. And the reason Jesus was able to bring peace to that situation was because he had peace on the inside. He was in the storm, but he didn't let the storm get in him. Jesus was able to speak to the storm because he had peace on the inside. Now I'm going to go out on a theological limb here and wonder, might it have had anything to do with the fact that, oh, I don't know, that, that he was God? I mean, I know it's a stretch, but might it have had something to do with the fact that he was God in human flesh? I don't know. Speaking to storms, making them go away, something that only God can do, is a good segue into our next doctrine, the little God's doctrine. All of the faith preachers teach that if you are saved, you are in fact a little God. Consider this exposition of Genesis 1, 26 and 27 from Creflo Dollar. Now, in verse 26 and verse 27, God now submits himself to this principle of everything producing after its own kind. 
And in verse 26 and 27, let's read it out loud. Ready? Read. And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Now that's interesting because if everything produces after its own kind, we now see God producing man. And if God now produces man, and everything produces after his own kind, if horses get together, they produce what? And if dogs get together, they produce what? If cats get together, they produce what? But if the Godhead gets together and say, let us make man, then what are they producing? They're producing gods. Now I gotta hit this thing real hard in the very beginning because I ain't got time to go through all this, but I'm gonna say to you right now, you are gods, little g. You are gods because you came from God and you are gods, you're not just human. The only human part about you is this physical body that you live in. The real me is just like God. The real me is just like God. Creflo Dollar's teaching that he just gave is so heretical on so many levels, it's hard to even know where to begin. The first is that he draws analogies from animals coming together and procreating, and he draws that analogy to the Triune Godhead. It's blasphemous. But also, dear friends, when the Bible says that God created man in his image, that means that as human beings, you and I are the pinnacle of God's creation. We're the pinnacle of his creation. And we have, we're created in his image in that we have the potential and the capacity through a saving relationship with Jesus Christ to know God. But dear friends, that does not mean that we are God. You know, I love dogs. I think dogs are great. I just love dogs. But the greatest, smartest dog in the world will never know God because he's not created in his image. You and I are. So we have the potential and capacity through Jesus Christ to know God, but that does not mean we are God. The Bible is very clear that there is only one God, and we ain't Him. That's not very good grammar, but that's pretty good theology. There's only one God. Now, some of you may be wondering, well, doesn't it say in the Bible somewhere that we are gods? Well, the faith preachers say that there is, and they would all appeal to John chapter 10, 30 through 34. Put this up on the screen and read it. Jesus says, I and my Father are one. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, Many good works have I showed you from my Father. For which of those works do you stone me? The Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we stone you not, but for blasphemy. And because that thou, being a man, makest thyself God. Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law? I said, Ye are gods. The faith preachers say, See, here Jesus is saying to these individuals, He's saying, is, Doesn't it say in your law that you are gods? Well, the passage to which Jesus is referring is this one, Psalm 82, verse 6 and 7, I, Asaph, Asaph have said, Ye are gods, you are all sons of the Most High, but you shall die like men and fall like one of the princes. Now, indeed, in Psalm 82, judges are called gods, but not because of their deity. They're called gods in reference to their status. In other words, these, these judges were put in positions in which they had to make decisions about matters of life and death. So in that sense, they were kind of uh, acting in a sense, they were doing some of the things, you know, taking on some of the, the responsibilities of God, making decisions of life and death. These judges were put in these positions, but it's very clear, look at verse seven. Asaph said to these judges, he said, but you shall die like men and fall like any one of the princes. So Asaph, I believe what Asaph here is doing here is he was using sarcasm. He was saying, you, you think you're gods, but, but you're going to die just like everyone else dies. I think he was using sarcasm. And so what Jesus was doing by employing this verse, he is saying what these judges were in theory, at least, or what they were by some, how some people esteem them, I am in reality. So Jesus was making a very clear statement and declaration of his deity. This is not at all teaching that men or women are gods. This is really taking this verse out of context. 
and the faith preachers should know that. If the faith preachers are honest, what they are teaching, this little God's doctrine is very similar to a heresy known as henotheism. Henotheism. What is henotheism? Well, henotheism is the belief that there are many gods, but that only one is really worthy of our worship. Who else believes in henotheism? The cults of Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses do as well. Not very good company that the faith preachers are keeping. Consider this audio clip from Kenneth Copeland. The Bible said he measured the heavens with a nine inch span. Now the span is the difference, the distance between the end of the thumb and the end of the little finger. And, and that Bible said, in fact, the Amplified Translation translates the Hebrew text that way, that he measured out the heavens with a nine inch span. Well, I got a ruler and measured mine and my span's eight and three quarter inches long. So now God's span is a quarter, of inch, a quarter inch longer than mine. So you see, that faith didn't come billowing out of some giant monster somewhere. It came out of the heart of a being that is very uncanny the way he's very much like you and me. A being that stands somewhere around 6'2", six 6'3", six that weighs somewhere in the neighborhood of a couple hundred pounds, a little better, has a span of eight and, I mean, nine inches across, stood up and said, Light be! And this universe situated itself and went into motion. Glory to God. So according to Kenneth Copeland, God is a being that stands 6'2", six 6'3", six weighs a couple hundred pounds. Sounds awfully human, doesn't he? Now let's carry this out to its logical conclusion. If God is 6'2", six 6'3", six weighs a couple hundred pounds, that means what? That means he's in a body. And if God is in a body, that means he cannot be everywhere at the same time, which means he's not omnipresent, and that's not the God of the Bible. If they preach a different God, they preach a different gospel. I want us now to look at the doctrine of the fall. This is really going to help us to understand the word faith movement. We're about to take a big leap forward in our understanding of word faith theology when we look at what they teach about the doctrine of the fall. And there are several items here. You might want to write these down if you're able to do so. Number one, the faith preachers teach that Adam was an exact duplicate of God. He was not a little like God. He was not a lot like God. He was God. That God literally reproduced himself in Adam. And Adam was a carbon copy of Yahweh. And according to Kenneth Hagin, Adam could stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with God and have no consciousness of inferiority whatsoever. Adam was another Yahweh. Well, we all know the story, right? Adam sinned, which of course begs the question. If Adam was Yahweh and he sinned, was it Yahweh who sinned? You see, you carry these doctrines out to their logical conclusion, you see how dark they are. But when Adam sinned, he lost his deity, transferred it to Satan. And when this happened, the real Yahweh God was kicked out of planet Earth and banished from it. And so now, even as we speak today, the real Yahweh God is up there somewhere, but he has no access to planet Earth. He's been kicked out, gone, see you later, bye. Well, somebody has to fill that void, right? So Satan is all too eager to step up to the plate, and he becomes the legal God of planet Earth. Well, guess what happens when a person gets saved? According to faith theology, guess what he gets back? Oh. He gets his godhood back. He becomes deity again. He becomes God again, just like Adam was before he fell. And this, dear friends, is why the faith preachers hold so tenaciously to health and wealth, because we're gods. And a god cannot be poor, and a god certainly cannot be sick. You see, for years, I thought this movement was just health and wealth prosperity. No, health and wealth prosperity are just the tips of the theological iceberg. They're just offshoots of a much more serious core theological problem. And let me also say this about the prosperity gospel. Now, the health and wealth prosperity gospel essentially says this. Come to Jesus because he'll make you wealthy and he'll heal your body. Two of the most basic and universal of all human desires. Most people want to be wealthy. And I don't know anyone who enjoys being sick. And the prosperity gospel says, come to Jesus and you can have it. They appeal to two of the most basic universal of all human desires. And so hordes of people, millions of them, flock to this gospel. And they, quote unquote, come to Christ. But is that the real gospel? Or is the real gospel something a little bit more like this? Come to Jesus because you realize you're a sinner. And because of your sin, the wrath of God abides on you. And the only way to escape that wrath is to repent of your sins, 
and place your trust in the Savior. That's the real gospel. And so friends, if you have all these millions of people that are coming to Christ, but they're responding to a different gospel. And if you come to Christ for the wrong reasons, then what you have is a false decision, a false conversion. How many millions of people have responded to this prosperity gospel and now think they're saved, but they've never truly come to grips with the fact that they're a sinner. They have to repent of sins and place their trust in the Savior. Consider this clip from Benny Hinn and Miles Monroe. The only creature that God gave authority in the earth legally to is a spirit in a dirt body. That means any spirit without a body is illegal on planet earth. But here's the bigger statement. Even God himself is illegal on earth. Why? Because he is a spirit. And the law he set up by his own mouth was that only spirits with bodies can function on earth legally. That's why God could not interfere when Adam and Eve was, you know, kind of deliberating on the fruit environment there in the book of Genesis. I mean, it, it bothered me. I'm sure it bothered you for years as a pastor. Uh, if God is so mighty, powerful, awesome, omnipotent, omniscient, why couldn't this mighty God who made 500 million planets and galaxies could not stop a skinny little woman from picking a fruit to destroy his whole program? I mean, come on, God, aren't you powerful? You can intervene. You can destroy the works of the devil, prevent the woman, and save humanity. But he couldn't. Not that he didn't. He couldn't. God couldn't. Why couldn't he? Because he'd been kicked out on planet Earth. This from Benny Hinn and Miles Monroe. Pastor, we get the mind of God about his will. We pray it. When we pray it, we give him legal right to perform it. Yes. Let me define prayer for you in this show. Prayer is man giving God permission or license to interfere in earth's affairs. In other words, prayer is earthly license for heavenly interference. That's incredible. That is incredible. God could do nothing on earth, nothing has God ever done on earth, without a human giving him access. So he's always looking for that somebody. Always looking for a human to give him power, permission. In other words, God has the power, but you get the permission. God got the authority and the power, but you got the license. So even though God could do anything, he can only do what you permit him to do. God can only do what we permit him to do. Dear friends, I would submit to you this morning that God can do whatever he jolly well wants to do. And you know, I don't think he's all that interested in whether or not he has our permission to do it. Now, if God can only do what we permit him to do, who's really in control here? We are. You see, it is a very man-centered system. It is not theocentric. It is not centered on God. This gospel is absolutely centered on man. And any gospel that is centered on man, rather than the person and the work of Jesus Christ, is a different gospel. It's a different gospel. And dear friends, a different gospel does not save. This from Kenneth Copeland. I was shocked when I found out who the biggest failure in the Bible actually is. Okay. You know, everybody asks you, say, who's the biggest failure? They say, Judas. Somebody else will say, no, I believe it's Adam. Well, how about the devil? He's the most consistent failure. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but he's not the biggest in terms of material failure and so forth. The biggest one in the whole Bible is God. Oh, what, what, what? Don't you turn that set off. <laughs> you listen to it. You, I told you, now, you sit still a minute. You know me well enough. No, I wouldn't, I wouldn't tell something. I can't prove the Bible. Can you imagine saying that God is the biggest failure in the Bible? He lost his top-ranking, most anointed angel, the first man he ever created, the first woman he ever created, the whole earth and all the fullness therein, a third of the angels at least. That's a big loss, man. I mean, you figure all that, that's a lot of real estate, brother gone down the drain. Now, the reason you don't think of God as a failure is he ain't never said he's a failure. <laughs> no. And you're not a failure till you say you're one. So we never think of God as a failure just because he never owned up to being one. But in actuality, you see, he really is. Friends, that is blasphemy. To teach that God is the biggest failure, to teach that God is any kind of failure, that is blasphemy. And I wonder if it's ever dawned on Kenneth Copeland that when Adam and Eve fell, that's not something that caught God off guard. 
That's not something that took him by surprise. The Bible says that the Lamb was slain before the foundation of the world. And it's blasphemy to teach that God is any kind of a failure. It's unbelievable. What of this doctrine that Satan is the legal God of planet Earth? Is there any scriptural support for this? Well, upon first consideration, it might would seem so. 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, Paul writes, In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. And uh, Satan is not named here specifically, but pretty much everyone agrees that Paul is here talking about Satan. And doesn't Paul call Satan the God of this world? Well, yes and no. Let's be good Brians. Let's search the scriptures to see if these things are really so. The word that we need to key in on here is this word I have highlighted, world. Now, if Paul had wanted to refer to this dirt and rock planet on which you and I are now sitting, he would have used the words Gia or Cosmos, which would literally refer to this dirt and rock sphere on which you and I are now sitting that is rotating on its axis and revolving around the sun. But that's not the word Paul used. The word Paul used in the Greek is the word aeon, which literally means age. So you see, Paul here is not making a legal statement. He's making a theological point. In essence, what Paul is saying is, is that this world, <clears throat> excuse me, this world is so sinful, so fallen, so depraved, that it follows after Satan as if he were the God of this age, but not the legal God of planet Earth. It's not at all what Paul is saying. And just in case this isn't convincing enough uh, to anyone here, I don't want anybody to hear, to uh, leave here today thinking, oh my goodness, what are we ever going to do? God's been kicked out of planet Earth. Satan's in control. Nope. I want everyone to go home and rest well knowing that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. Dear friends, God has not been kicked out of planet earth. He is still on his throne. He is still in control. You and I are not. Thank God for that. Thank God for that. Now let's look at what the faith preachers teach about the person and work of Jesus Christ. If we can establish that they preach a different Jesus, we can establish that they do indeed preach a different gospel. Many of the faith preachers, though I want to say in intellectual honesty, not all of them, but many of them teach that Jesus did not come as God. That Jesus came just as another man. Another man, just like you and me, who had a very close walk with God, but was not actually God himself. Some would teach that Jesus later became God. Some would teach he became God when he was baptized. Others say well, he became God when he after he descended into hell and had to be reborn. But he was not actually God in Bethlehem. This is what Creflo Dollar said in his sermon, Jesus' Growth into Sonship. Here's what I want you to get here. If Jesus came as God, then why did God have to anoint him? Jesus came as a man. That's why it was legal to anoint him. Y'all please listen to me. Please listen to me. This ain't no heresy. I'm not some false prophet. <laughs> Creflo Dollar teaches that Jesus did not come as God, just as another man who had to be anointed by God. We really begin to understand that, that, that when Jesus Christ paid the price, the first thing that happened after he said it is finished is the veil was rent from top to bottom, signifying that no man could do that. But the price that was paid was there's now no separation. So that we have direct access in the Holy of Holies. We understand, according to Hebrews, that Jesus is our high priest. Absolutely. And he's the first of many brethren, which means I now come into a priestly anointing. So I now can... Say that again, because I they now, don't get it. I now come into a priestly anointing. Jesus is not the only begotten. Come on. Son of God. He is not. I'm a son he's of God. He's the first fruit. You, you're the, he's the first fruit. He's the first born of many. Okay. Jesus is not the only begotten on. Son of God. This from Kenneth Copeland. Kenneth Copeland writes, or he teaches, he says, the word, of, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. What word? The word of the covenant that God cut with Abraham way back there years before. God was making promises to Jesus and Jesus wasn't even there. But you see, God deals with things that are not, and yet, are not yet as though they already were. Kenneth Copeland stunningly teaches that Jesus was not in existence until he became flesh in manger in Bethlehem. He is denying the pre-existence of Jesus Christ. This is a different Jesus of the Bible. Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am. Consider this video clip from Kenneth Copeland. And Jesus volunteered to go to hell. I'm going to tell you something. Ain't nobody ever got out of there. The only thing he had to go by was the promise of God that I'm reading you right now. He didn't have some special revelation from heaven between he and God the Father. No, the Bible said he emptied himself. 
when he came, and he saw himself in the Word and said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He found himself in the Word. So according to Kenneth Copeland, Jesus was just another man who, who walked into church one day and started reading the Bible and went along and said, oh, well, look at here, I'll be John Brown, look who I am. He found himself in the Word, had no idea who he was. He just found himself in the Word. Friends, that is a different Jesus of the Bible. If they preach a different Jesus, they preach a different gospel. And a different gospel does not save. This word faith teaching on the person and work of Jesus Christ is very similar to an ancient heresy known as monarchianism. It's very similar also to a heresy known as Arianism. Arianism held that Jesus did not come as God. He was just another man who had a very close walk with God, but was not God himself. And Arianism was a struggle for the early church. It was something that the early church had to deal with. Came up for a vote in the Council of Nicaea in AD 325, and this heresy was voted down convincingly. And so um, the ancient church did away with this, the early church did away with this ancient heresy years ago, centuries ago, and yet the faith preachers won't hold on to it. Nothing new under the sun. The following is a prophecy given to Kenneth Copeland, supposedly from Jesus himself. According to Kenneth Copeland, Jesus himself physically appeared to him and gave him this prophecy. Quote, unquote, Jesus said to Kenneth, Don't be disturbed when people accuse you of thinking you are God. They crucified me for claiming that I was God, but I didn't claim I was God. I just claimed that I walked with him. He was in me. Hallelujah. That's what you're doing. Kenneth Copeland took some criticism for this false prophecy, and rightly so, and he went on TVN to try to explain it away. We're still questioning what was said about that prophecy. That prophecy never mentioned the Son of God. Never said anything about the Son of God. What did it say? It said, I did not claim to be God. Mm -hmm. in, that's all it said. In, in other words, in so many words, you're right. Nowhere in the New Testament did he literally get Preach up and, claim and say, God. I am God, did he? No, no. I stand corrected. And the it. Christian attitude... Kenneth Copeland said, Jesus never claimed to be God. I beg to differ. Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am. If you have seen me, you have seen the Father. I and the Father are one. Jesus most certainly did claim to be God. And any Jesus that he's preaching that did not claim to be God is a different Jesus of the Bible. If they preach a different Jesus, they preach a different gospel. Friends, we're not talking here about the date of the Exodus or who wrote the book of Hebrews. These issues go to the heart of Orthodox Christianity. What one believes about Jesus Christ will determine where one spends eternity never to be done without, outdone with himself. This also from Kenneth Copeland. Kenneth Copeland says, and I say this with all respect so it don't upset you too bad, but I say it anyway. When I read in the Bible where he says, I am, I just smile and I say, I am too. Unbelievable. Now let us turn our attention to the spiritual death of Jesus. Pretty much all of the faith preachers teach this, that Jesus' physical death on the cross was not enough to atone for sins. He also had to die spiritually, where he suffered, was tormented in hell, had to be reborn, and that is where the atonement of our sins took place. Not on the cross, but in hell. Jesus had to go through that same spiritual death in order to pay the price. Now, it wasn't the physical death on the cross that paid the price for sin, because if it had been, any prophet of God that had died for the last couple of thousand years before that could have paid that price. It wasn't physical death. Anybody could do that. Anybody could do that? Really? Dear friends, if you've sinned once, you couldn't do that. Physical death was not enough, says Kenneth Copeland. Why did Jesus then on the cross say, my God? Because God was not his father anymore. He took upon himself the nature of Satan. That is hard for me to even repeat, much less teach his truth. Jesus took upon himself the satanic nature. Fred Price. Satan was seated on his throne with a sickening grin on his face, his lip twisted in grotesque triumph, and all the imps of hell were dancing a jig. And the word came, we got him now, we've defeated the plan of God. And the devil was sitting there saying, I told you, if you'd follow me, I'd lead you to victory. We got him now. And they wrapped their grimy hands and the chains of hell itself around Jesus. And they consigned him to one of the cells in the Hades section of the underworld. And then Satan and his demon host went on a three-day drunk. They thought they had him. They had defeated and thwarted the plan of Almighty God and Jesus sat there as it were 
immobile, not saying a word, not doing anything except serving our sentence. Fred Price says that Jesus was helpless, couldn't do anything while, the, while Satan and his demonic cords were tormenting and having their way with him. That is not the Jesus that I worship. From where does this doctrine originate, the spiritual death of Jesus doctrine? Well, it comes from our old friend Essek W. Kenyon. Kenyon one day was reasoning about sin this way, and he thought, well, sin is a spiritual problem, which of course it is. And he reasoned that a physical death could not possibly pay for a spiritual problem. So he thought there had to have been two deaths, one physical and one spiritual of Jesus. So with this preconceived theology in mind, he then went to the Word and he, tar he started pouring through the Bible to try to find some verse to substantiate his doctrine, which, by the way, is the exact opposite way that we're supposed to read our Bibles. You see, you don't begin with your preconceived theology and then go try to find some verse to support it. That's called eisegesis, reading into the text. No, you begin with the Word of God and you get your doctrine and theology out from it. Exegesis, you don't read into it. Eisegesis, you get out from it. Exegesis. But Kenyon thought he struck gold because he found Isaiah 53, 9, which says, And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. And Kenyon looked at this Messianic uh, prophecy here, looked at this verse, and he looked at this word that I have highlighted here, death. He got out his Hebrew grammar helps, and he looked this word up, and he said, Aha, Eureka, I have found it. This word, death, in the Hebrew is plural. So it must have meant there were two deaths, one physical and one spiritual. Well, you know what? In a sense, he's right. This is indeed a plural word. But the fact of the matter is, is that this is just one of literally dozens of examples in the Hebrew Old Testament of a plural word that refers to a singular antecedent. And that's exactly what we have here. It's just a quirk of Hebrew grammar. At the most, what you could say about this is that it is a plural of intensity, which means simply that the plurality of this verbs, this word just emphasizes the particular violence of the death. Not at all that there were two deaths. This is just a little nuance of Hebrew grammar. Nothing more and nothing less. So to Essek W. Kenyon, we have to say, nice try, but no cigar. This from Kenneth Copeland. He paid the price. He suffered so you and I don't have to go there. Now, if he hadn't suffered it in the spirit as well as the flesh, the flesh cannot make sacrifice for spiritual things. If the flesh could make sacrifice for spiritual things, then the, the, the flesh of animals would have gone a lot closer and a lot further than they did. The spirit then, Jesus' very own holy, pure, sinless spirit paid the sin price for your spirit. Why is this such a dangerous doctrine, the spiritual death of Jesus? Dear friends, if Jesus died spiritually, then that means he ceased to be God. And if Jesus ceased to be God even for an instant, then he never was God to begin with. Because God cannot cease being God. He is immutable. That means he does not change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. It's there, if there was ever a time when Jesus was not God, then he never was God to begin with. It was the physical death of Jesus that paid for our sins. The faith preachers hold so tenaciously to the spiritual death of Jesus, it's very important for them because this, this goes to a doctrine known as identification. And according to word faith theology, we can identify with what Christ did in that Jesus, according to faith theology, died spiritually, separated from God, and had to be reborn, had to get saved. That's what happens to us. We are dead spiritually and we are reborn through faith in Christ, we are saved. And so therefore, according to Kenneth Copeland, Kenneth Hagin, the believer is just as much an incarnation as was Jesus of Nazareth. So therefore, we can have everything that Jesus has. We can do everything that Jesus can do. We should never be sick. It's all this identification doctrine and it's related also to the little God's doctrine. They're all connected, this identification. So. It was the physical death of Jesus that paid for our sins, not a spiritual death. Now, some of you may, may be wondering, well, didn't Jesus say on the cross, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Yes, he did. Let's look at this. Jesus did indeed say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He's quoting Psalm 22, verse 1. And the faith preachers and even a lot of more mainstream evangelicals have taken this verse to say, oh, well, Jesus was separated from God. And of course, if he was separated from God, he died spiritually. Now, 
First thing we need to notice, Jesus is quoting Psalm 22. And by quoting the first verse of Psalm 22, he is applying not only that verse to himself, he is also applying the entire context to himself, the entire passage, the entire chapter. Let's go on in Psalm 22. Verses 19 and verse 24 says, But be not thou far from me, O Lord, for he has not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. Neither hath he hid his face from him, but when he cried unto him, he heard. The psalmist was not completely separated from God. He felt estranged from God. Jesus was not separated from the Father. We see that from these two verses, verse 19, verse 24, the same chapter. At some level, I think we have to bend our knee and say that there's a certain mystery to what Jesus experienced on the cross. There's a certain mystery there that we can't fully understand. I think absolutely, Jesus in his humanity, okay, in his humanity, Jesus felt some estrangement from the Father when the wrath of God was being poured out on him. But in his deity, he was never separated from the Father. Never. What's the last thing that Jesus said on the cross? He said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. The very last thing that Jesus, Jesus said on the cross he was, was a prayer. He was praying to the Father. So we know that those lines of communication within the triune Godhead were as much intact as they ever were. In his humanity, Jesus undoubtedly felt some estrangement, but not in his deity. There was never a time when Jesus was separated from the Father. There was never a time when Jesus ceased to be God. It was the physical death of Jesus that paid for our sins. What did Jesus say on the cross? It is finished. His work was completed on the cross. Very close to the spiritual death of Jesus doctrine is the faith preacher's teaching that Jesus was made sin. Not that he took our sin, he was literally made sin. He was literally turned into sin and therefore, of course, died spiritually. It's similar to the Catholic doctrine of transubstantiation, if I can draw an analogy here. Catholics believe that when you take communion and you take the little wafer, what they call the host, and you put it on your tongue, that it literally turns into the flesh of Jesus Christ. And when you drink the wine, it literally turns into his blood. In a similar vein, the faith preachers teach that when Jesus was on the cross, he literally turned into sin, metamorphosized into sin. This from Kenneth Copeland. He became sin. He was made sin. Now he's in the pit of hell. He's down there. He's in there. Suffering like no man has ever suffered. Death and all of, all of hell's emissaries have piled in there on him to annihilate this one called the Son of God. Do you remember what happened in the desert when Israel was bitten by those snakes? And God told Moses, put a serpent on the pole. And the Bible said this was a type of Jesus. Now I want you to know, I don't mind telling you, that made me, that, that irritated me. I didn't like that a bit. I went to the Lord about it. I said, I don't like this. He said, what is it you don't like? I said, I don't like, I don't like that serpent, that snake, the thing that, there's an illustration of Satan being put up there and you say, that's a type of Jesus. He said, you will and you understand what it meant. I said, well, what did it mean? He said, when he bore your sickness, he was made sin with your sin. Jesus was made sin. Is there any scriptural support for this? Well, the faith preachers would say yes, and upon first consideration, again, it might seem so. 2 Corinthians 5.21, He made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Well, it doesn't say right there that Jesus was made sin. Well, not exactly. Let's be good Bereans. Search the scriptures to see if these things are really so. The word in question here that is rendered as sin in the Greek is the word hamartia. And hamartia may be rendered as sin. It may also, however, be rendered as sin offering. How do you know which is correct? You know which is correct by the context of the passage. And I want us to look at the context of this passage by looking at another text which uses this same verse. This is what from the uh, Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament. Yet it was the will of the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief when he makes himself an offering for sin. It's the very same word, the word hamartia, but yet here it is rendered as sin offering. The context of this is the Old Testament sacrificial system. And in the Old Testament, when an animal was sacrificed, that animal had to be pure and holy before it was sacrificed. It had to remain pure and holy on the altar while it was being sacrificed. And it had to remain pure and holy after the sacrifice. 
Jesus was the ultimate fulfillment of that for us. Dear friends, Jesus was holy before the cross. Jesus was holy on the cross. Jesus remains holy today after the cross. Jesus did not turn into sin. He was made an offering for our sin. There is a big, big difference. The Bible is very clear that it was the physical death of Christ that paid for our sins. Jesus died, he was buried, he was raised, and he appeared. Peter writes, For Christ also died for sins how many times? Once for all, the just for the unjust, so that he might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit. Literally in the Greek, made alive by the Spirit of God. More Bible proof. The Apostle Paul writes, much more then, being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. It was the physical death of Jesus that paid for our sins. One thing that you'll notice about every cult, every cult disparages the cross of Jesus Christ, that it somehow just isn't enough to pay for sins. Mormons disparage it, Jehovah's Witnesses disparage it, those people who call themselves Christians that, fit, that teach a work salvation disparage the cross. And sadly, the word faith preachers disparage the cross of our Lord Christ. Our last video clip of this session is one of the more disturbing ones I've seen from Kenneth Copeland. Consider this and listen very carefully to what he says here. You can't break the new covenant. You can get out of fellowship with it, but you can't break it. It's between God and Jesus. And he comes and puts his arm around you and says, Now, little brother, now let me tell you something now. Uh, you be my joint there. If you'll let me run your life, and just be obedient to me. The same thing that happened to me in hell, I'll cause to happen to you in your spirit right now. I got resurrected, you get resurrected. I got filled with the Holy Ghost, you get filled with the Holy Ghost. I got a glorified body, you get a glorified body. I have a covenant with my Father. And uh, you can get in on my part. <laughs> I'll give you my covenant with him. And even when you mess up, keep your mouth shut yes. and come to me. That's right. yes. That's right. Repent the thing before me and I'll cleanse you from all unrighteousness. I won't even let him know you did Do you see what Kenneth Copeland just did? Kenneth Copeland has now pitted God the Son against God the Father. And now God the Son is keeping secrets from God the Father. Now let's carry this out to its logical conclusion. If Jesus is keeping secrets from the Father, then that means there are things that the Father does not know, which means he is not omniscient, and that's not the God of the Bible. And any Jesus who's keeping secrets from the Father is not the Jesus of the Bible. If they preach a different Jesus, they preach a different gospel. And a different gospel does not save. I want us to return to this passage of scripture that Peter writes to us. I think it'll have even more meaning for us now. Peter writes, but false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will also be false teachers among you, who will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing swift destruction upon themselves. Many will follow their sensuality, and because of them, the way of truth will be maligned. And in their greed, they will exploit you with false words. Peter writes, and he says, False prophets arose among the people. There will be false teachers among you. And notice, how are they going to introduce these destructive heresies? With flags a-waving, guns a-blazing? No, secretly introduce the destructive heresies. They will have some truth. Remember the illustration of water. But they'll mix in that, with that truth, air and heresy to corrupt the entire thing. Secretly introducing the destructive heresies to fly in under our spiritual radars. Even denying the master who bought them. Any man who would teach that Jesus did not come as God, is denying the Jesus of the Bible. Any man who would teach that Jesus is keeping secrets from the Father, denying the Jesus of the Bible, bringing swift destruction upon themselves who just don't yet know it. Many will follow their sensuality. This movement is large and it's growing. And because of them, the way of truth will be maligned. What way of truth is that? The truth of the gospel of our Lord Christ is being maligned, it's being distorted, drugged through the mud by these false teachers. And in their greed, they will exploit you with false words. The King James says they will make merchandise out of you. All of the faith preachers are opulently wealthy, and they are making merchandise out of God's people. Every phrase fits to a T what we see today in the modern prosperity gospel. Every phrase. And the last word in this session 
we will give to Kenneth Copeland. I'm telling you folks, this is serious, but this is serious, but this is serious, but... On that, we agree. This is serious business. I hope this has been helpful to you. And again, it is my prayer that this seminar will help equip you to do what Ephesians 4.15 tells us to do, to speak the truth in love. Uh, this session is entitled Mangled Manifestations. In this session, we'll look at some of the more dramatic, spectacular things of the faith movement, the things that you can see and touch. I uh, will say that some of what you see this afternoon will be comical. Some of what you see will be disturbing. So just a little heads up there. Let us begin with the abuse of the gift of tongues. Now, tongues is probably the most debated spiritual gift today, and there is a debate within Christianity today as to whether or not the gift of tongues is still in effect. Some who hold a view known as cessationism believe that tongues and prophecy and some of the other more dramatic sign gifts have ceased with the dying of the apostles and the closing of the canon of scripture. Other Christians believe that all of the spiritual gifts are still in effect today. And that debate is beyond the purposes, uh, the scope of our, our uh, visit here today. It's just far too complicated and involved to get into. But uh, regardless of your view, regardless of your view, what we all should be able to agree upon as Christians is that if the gift of tongues is exercised, it must be exercised within biblical parameters. Regardless of your view, it must be exercised within biblical parameters. And that's true, of course, not only the gift of tongues, that's true of all of the spiritual gifts. So there are just a few items that I want us to look at in uh, dealing with the gift of tongues, just kind of in a general nature. Number one, tongues are not unique to Christianity. Some pagan religions speak in tongues as well. Uh, some Hindus speak in tongues, even a few Muslims, if you can believe that, speak in tongues. So just because someone is speaking in tongues does not necessarily mean he or she is getting that ability from God. Tongues can be practiced in an ignorant, ungodly manner. This is very clear from Scripture. Uh, tongues can be practiced in such a way that it brings attention to the individual rather than glorifying Christ and edifying the church. If done in public, in corporate worship, an interpreter must always be present. This too is very clear from Scripture. The Apostle Paul says, if there is no one there to interpret, then let him remain silent. And when you look at that in the Greek, that's actually very strong language. If Paul were saying that today, he would in effect be telling this person to shut up because He's just bringing, bringing attention to himself, not to Jesus. It is false that all believers should speak in tongues. Some denominations teach that if you are saved, your salvation will be evidenced by you speaking in tongues. And if you don't speak in tongues, you're not saved. This is patently unbiblical. The Apostle Paul asks a series of rhetorical questions. He says, all are not workers of miracles, are they? All are not teachers, are they? All do not speak in tongues, do they? And clearly, the implied answer to these rhetorical questions is no. No, they don't. So it's patently unbiblical to teach that if you are saved, your salvation will be evidenced by you speaking in tongues. To teach that can lead a person to do one of two things. It can lead a person to uh, fake the gift, which can be quite easily done, or it can lead a person to unnecessarily doubt his or her salvation. And finally, tongues is the least important of all the spiritual gifts. The Apostle Paul did not put a great deal of emphasis on the gift of tongues, possibly because he knew that it could be so easily faked. And the fact of the matter is, you can teach a canary how to speak in tongues. It's not really all that hard. It can be a learned behavior. I have a dear friend in California who uh, used to be in this movement, and in this movement, while in this movement, she spoke in tongues. Uh, now the Lord has brought her out, and she no longer speaks in tongues, but she can still do it. You know, I can, she can just do it at will, just like you turn on and off the light switch. I say, Karen, say something in tongues, and she just rattle it off. It's nothing spiritual. It's just a, a technique that she's uh, learned how to, to uh, utilize. So. Just because someone is speaking in tongues doesn't necessarily mean he or she is getting that ability from God. And uh, I have actually seen literature from a church that teaches people how to speak in tongues. Now, my question is, if this is something for which the Holy Spirit gives us utterance, why is it necessary to teach someone how to do it? And so, with that question in mind, I would submit to you the following clips. Charismatic renewal. Um, a renewed understanding of the work of the Holy Spirit amongst Christians of all denominations. We need to release him. We have to let him out. Just begin to offer him sounds. Just offer him sounds, like a little child learning to talk. And don't pay any attention to how you feel or how you sound. Just... That's right, say Jesus. There's the experience where you say you're saved, then there's the fire baptism when you get the Holy Ghost, and that's the tongues thing. And they love to work people over. You've got to, like, shoot in on this. When you see people gathering around people and start 
laying hands on and praying with someone, you've got to like come in with the camera too. It's very important because they'll be laying hands on someone and the poor person will be saying, you know, thank you, Jesus. Now, this is a person that's already saved, but they're getting the baptism. And someone will be standing there and be going, you know, and the poor person will be standing there and they're not saying anything. Then after a while, about four or five more will gather around and they'll start doing the same thing. They'll come on, speak it out, speak it out. So all of a sudden, the person will, you know, get so overwhelmed by the thing that they start going, you know, and the next thing, ah, oh, that's it, you've got it. Like they feel good. We've got another one, you know. Then they'll go on to the next person. Said, are you dumb? Spotless, are they white? No, thank you, Jesus. Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Jesus is so good to me tonight. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I praise the Lord. Oh, glory, glory. Hallelujah. I feel good in my soul. <laughs> praise the Lord. Oh. That was a man named Marjo. Uh, Marjo's parents named him after Mary and Joseph, a contraction of Mary and Joseph Marjo. And his parents were evangelists, and they taught him how to preach. At the tender age of four, Marjo began preaching. And in his early adult life, Marjo had his own evangelism ministry, and he traveled across the country preaching meetings and, and healing folks, supposedly. And uh, boy, he could speak in tongues, and he could slay people in the spirit, do the whole nine yards. But uh, Marjo grew tired of it, and uh, several years later, he directed a full-length motion picture on documentary on himself. And in this documentary, he made a big announcement. And he said, oh, by the way, I'm a fake. Everything he did was fake. Marjo wasn't even a believer, uh, an agnostic at best. But yet you see how he could go around and he could preach and he could speak in tongues and he could do the whole nine yards. He could turn the gift of tongues on and off just like you do a light switch. And so proof positive that just because someone is speaking in tongues doesn't necessarily mean that he is getting that ability from God. I want us to look at a passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 4. You're, of course, welcome to consult your copy of God's Word, but I'm going to put this up on the screen, too. But before I do, let me give you a little bit of background information to the book of 1 Corinthians. The Apostle Paul was out on his second missionary journey, and he came to the city of Corinth. And there in Corinth, the Apostle Paul preached the gospel. A number of people were saved, and Paul spent about 18 months with them, discipling them and growing them up in their relationship with Christ. And when he felt like they had reached a level of spiritual maturity sufficient enough to carry things on in his absence, Paul left them and went to other destinations to preach the gospel. Well, Paul may have left a little bit too soon because some time passed and got a letter from a lady named Chloe back in Corinth. And in this letter, Chloe informed the Apostle Paul that things had gone awry in the church in Corinth, that there was a group of people within this church who had become very arrogant in their exercise of the spiritual gifts. And it had almost become a contest between them as to who could prove themselves to be the most spiritual. You know, well, I'm more spiritual than you are because I speak in tongues more than you do. I have the gift of healing more strongly than you do. Look at me. Look how spiritual I am. They even gave themselves a name. They called themselves the pneumaticoi, which in the Greek means the spirituals. And because of this spiritual arrogance, all kinds of sin and immorality crept into the church and it just about destroyed the church from the inside out. And when the Apostle Paul heard of this, he was very vexed of heart, and he sat down and he wrote a letter to the church in Corinth, and that letter is what we have today as the book of 1 Corinthians. So I'm going to read this passage in the way in which the Apostle Paul would have wanted it read and understood by use of my voice inflection. Chapter 4, verse 6. The Apostle Paul writes, Now these things, brethren, I have figuratively applied to myself and Apollos for your sakes, that in us ye might learn not to exceed what is written in order that no one of you might become arrogant in behalf of one against the other. It's a very important precept here. The Apostle Paul writes to these Corinthians, and he says, do not exceed what is written. Dear friends, as Christians, we are not to exceed what is written us in God's Word. We are not to add anything to the Bible, nor are we to take anything away from it. We are to stay safely within biblical parameters. In matters of belief, matters of our theology, and in matters of what we practice, we are to stay safely within biblical parameters because when we exceed what is written, when we exceed biblical parameters, what we are doing is we are opening ourselves up to demonic influence and demonic suggestion. Paul continues, For who regards you as superior? And what do you have that you did not receive? But if you did receive it, why do you boast as if you had not received it? Paul is saying, why are you boasting about something that was given to you? You see, spiritual gifts are just that. They are gifts given to us when we're saved. They're not anything that we earn, not anything towards which we work. They're given to us. And Paul is saying, why are you boasting about something that was given to you? You see, the exercise of spiritual gifts should say nothing about the person displaying them. It should say everything about the one who gives them. Paul continues, 
you are already filled. You've already become rich. You've become kings without us. And I would indeed that you had become kings so that we might also reign with you. Very sarcastic. For I think God has exhibited us apostles last of all as men condemned to death because we have become a spectacle to the world, both to angels and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake, but you, no, you're prudent in Christ. We are weak, but you, you're strong. You are distinguished, but we are without honor. To this present hour, we are both hungry and thirsty and are poorly clothed, roughly treated, and are homeless. Doesn't sound much like prosperity to me. And we toil, working with our own hands. When we are vowed, we bless. When we are persecuted, we endure. When we are slandered, we try to conciliate. We have become as the scum of the world, the dregs of all things, even until now. And in verse 14, it's like the Apostle Paul pauses, catches his breath, maybe he blushes a little bit, and he says, I do not write these things to shame you, but to admonish you as my beloved children. To give you a very technical theological term to what the Apostle Paul is doing here in this passage, uh, I learned this at seminary. I hope it impresses you. Paul's taking these folks out to the woodshed. <laughs> Paul's taking these folks out to the woodshed and he is whooping them. He's slam dunking them. Paul is writing to correct some of the very same kind of behavior that we see day in and day out on Christian television and what's going on in many of these churches. Same kind of behavior that was going on in the church in Corinth is going on today. And that's what Paul was addressing. And sometimes as I watch Christian television and I go to these meetings, I just find myself asking the question in my mind to these individuals, have you even read the book of 1 Corinthians? Do you have the foggiest idea what this book is about? Because much of 1 Corinthians was written to correct some of the very same kind of behavior that's going on today. And um, just as a little aside, I'm a Baptist and, and as I travel around this great land of ours, sometimes I'll see a Corinth Baptist church. That would be the last name I would want to name my church. I don't know. but. Anyway, that's, that's free. That won't cost you. Uh, consider this video clip of Kenneth Copeland and Rodney Howard Brown. Rodney Howard Brown is the man who calls himself the Holy Ghost bartender. No worries what other people think. No, uh -huh. doesn't matter what they think. If I were to give you an assignment, and your assignment was to go home for me tonight and write out a skit to demonstrate how not to speak in tongues, that would be it. Every biblical parameter there is on the gift of tongues, they just broke. And what does that kind of behavior do to glorify Christ or to edify the saints? Nothing. Who does that bring attention to? Themselves. Same kind of thing that's going on in the church of Corinth, going on today. And uh, this little bit on the lighter side, a little blast from the past, Robert Tilton. Isn't that something called a moshoko doma zata? Zata toto motondo itiki shikanda kapoko toko toko laka moshiti. Kali shikado boko tola boko tai shikabo toko laka moko teya. I love you. Robert Tilton's so spiritual he can even speak in baby talk tongues. Now let's look at spectacular claims. All of the faith preachers have these wild, spectacular claims about how God is just doing amazing things through their ministries. This is one of the ways they get you to continue following their ministries and get you to continue opening up your wallets to their ministries. This from Benny Hinn. I was in Ghana just recently. We had half a million people show up, and a man was raised from the dead on the platform. That's a fact, people. Do you literally believe that someone has been resurrected on the program? Oh, John, I would not believe God. Uh, God can raise the dead, absolutely. 
I have not seen it. In that one case, we did hear about it. They brought a man, and this man was put uh, uh, on the platform, and he was dead. The man was dead. I have not seen it. In that one case, we did hear about it. And a man was ra raised from the dead on the platform. That's a fact, people. I have not seen it. But here's first what I see for, for TBN. You're going to have people raised from the dead watching this network. You're going to have people raised from the dead watching TBN. I'm telling you, I see this in the spirit. It's going to be so awesome. Jesus, I give you praise for this. That people around the world, maybe not so much in America, people around the world who will lose loved ones will say to undertakers, uh, not yet. I want to take my dead loved one and place them in front of that TV set for 24 hours. In, in. I'm telling you, Jesus. people will be, people, I'm telling you, I feel the anointing talking here. Oh, Jesus. People are going to be canceling funeral services Merciful. and bringing their dead in their caskets, placing them, my God, I feel the anointing here, in, in. placing them before a television set, waiting for God's part to come through and touch them. Merciful. I see rows of, um, ca of caskets lining up in front of this TV set. And I see him bringing them closer to the TV set. Mm -hmm. And as people are coming closer, I see uh, l actually loved ones picking up the hands of the dead and letting them touch the screen. And people are, are getting raised. TBN will no longer be just a television network. It will be an extension of heaven to earth. No, Jesus, mercy. Oh, for I, I'm, I'm, the Lord, the Lord just said to me, the Lord just said to me these words. I'm hearing myself saying for the first time, TBN will not be only a Christian network. It will be an extension of heaven to the earth. An extension. It will be like a, like a tube from heaven that the earth can look and say, I'm looking at heaven. I'm partaking of, of heaven. I'm, I'm, I'm getting connected to heaven through this TV too. If I can say it, it will be heaven's signal to the earth. It would be as though heaven is transmitting and earth is receiving through that set. So if you want to go to heaven, you want to see heaven, you want to taste heaven, turn on that channel because mm. you will. Mm -hmm. Now as ridiculous as that obviously is, there is something more sinister at work here. Benny Hinn says that TBN will be like an extension from heaven to the earth, like a tube from heaven to the earth. What the faith preachers would never admit in so many words, dear friends, yet unmistakably, the consequence of what, much of what they teach is this, is that the consequence of what they teach has an undeniable tendency to divorce God's people from their reliance upon his word. Think about what he said, TBN will be like an extension from heaven to the earth. He says, so if you want to know what heaven's like, if you want to taste heaven, turn on TBN. So, in other words, don't, don't labor in the, in the book under the direction and leadership of the Holy Spirit. No, that's too hard. Just turn on TBN because it's like a tube from heaven to the earth. The faith preachers would never admit it. But the extension of what they teach, undeniably, leads people to a place where they are becoming more and more divorced from their alliance upon the Word of God. This, too, from Benny Hinn. I believe that Jesus, God's Son, is about to appear physically in meetings and to believers around the world to wake us up. He appeared after his resurrection and he's about to appear before his second coming. The Lord has done this in the past, but he's about to do it again. Now hear this, I'm prophesying this. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is about to appear physically in some churches and some meetings and to many of his people for one reason, to tell you he's about to show up. <laughs> Might the Bible have anything to say about this prophecy? Indeed, Jesus' own words, Then if any man shall say unto you, Behold, here is the Christ, or there he is, do not believe him. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, so as to deceive, if possible, even the elect. Behold, I have told you in advance. Jesus told us these individuals would show up. Here they are. Many of you may have heard about one Todd Bentley recently who has made uh, huge waves in the uh, 
hyper charismatic signs and wonders word of faith world. Uh, Todd Bentley has had a number of spectacular claims himself. In fact, I've been studying these individuals for a long time. Todd Bentley uh, by far is the most bizarre and I think heretical of them all. But among the claims that Todd Bentley made, one of them, he claimed that a 14 foot tall angel named Emma is the one that came and began this healing revival that broke out in Lakeland, Florida earlier in 2008, spring of 08. And uh, interestingly, this 14 foot tall angel named Emma supposedly is the same angel that appeared to William Branham who was a false prophet who claimed that the Trinity was a demonic doctrine. The very first time Todd Bentley mentioned this, that this angel was from William Branham, that should have been a huge red flag to everyone around him. Whoa, wait a minute. Let's put on the brakes here and look at this thing. But nobody seemed to want to do that. Also, Bentley claimed that thousands of documented healings and over 30 people were raised from the dead in this revival in Lakeland, Florida. Uh, he actually challenged the news media to come down and check his story out. I was there in uh, May of this year of 08 and he was on stage and he said come on CNN, come on Fox News, come on MSNBC you come down here and you check these stories out we have the documented proof and so Nightline came down and then they, they interviewed Todd Bentley and uh, they asked him, they said do you have any documented proof? He said oh yes, and they said well we would like to have three examples and Bentley said oh we can give you thousands and they said no just give us three and so finally Todd Bentley's ministry forwarded three examples of supposed healings and when you start tracing these things out and following them, doctors' names were blotted out, patients' names blotted out, phone numbers missing. None of the stories uh, were documented, none of them. And presumably these three were probably the best Todd Bentley could, could afford. None of them panned out. And by the way, of these 30 people who were supposedly raised from the dead, no one has yet to come up on stage and say, I'm one of those 30, I was dead, now I'm alive. Also, Todd Bentley claimed that he went to heaven. He was sucked up into heaven through a column of fire, found himself on an operating table in heaven where he was strapped down by four angels, two on each side, and they proceeded to cut him open with a miter saw in heaven. And then started stuffing him full of white boxes, which were full of giftings, wisdom, discernment. He didn't get much of that. And uh, it just so bizarre, friends, you cannot make this stuff up. It is that bizarre. Todd Bentley also claimed to regularly hear from God. God told him to do a number of these, number of things, and among some of the things that God told him to do, one of them, God told Todd Bentley to leg drop the pastor of the particular church he was in. This is a wrestling move that you see in professional wrestling. And so Todd Bentley said he ran over to the pastor and he leg dropped the pastor. Friends, if your worship service has gotten to the point where you can no longer distinguish a worship service from professional wrestling, something's wrong. God also supposedly told Todd Bentley to go up to a crippled woman and bang her legs up and down on the platform like a baseball bat. All of this is on YouTube. Go to YouTube and search for it. It's there. And probably most famously or infamously as the case may be, God supposedly told Todd Bentley to go up to an elderly woman and kick her in the face with his biker boot and then she would be healed. And Todd Bentley said, that he went up to this woman and kicked her in the face with the spiker boot. He said the woman fell over, the power of God hit her and the woman fell over and I was thinking, well man, I bet she did fall over, you kicked her in the face. I said, God, I've prayed for like a hundred crippled people, not one. He said, that's because I want you to grab that lady's crippled legs and bang them up and down on the platform like a baseball bat. I walked up and I grabbed her legs and I started going, be healed, be healed. I started banging them up and down on the platform. She got healed. And I'm thinking, God, why is not the power of God moving? He said, because you haven't kicked that woman in the face. And there's this older lady worshiping right in front of the platform. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me. The gift of faith came on me. He said, kick her in the face with your biker boot. I inched closer and I went like this. Bam! And just as my boot made contact with her nose, she fell into the power of God. And there's actually another clip of Todd Bentley on YouTube where a, a man came up with stage four colon cancer up on stage. He had stage four colon cancer. Todd Bentley told him to raise his arms. The guy raised his arms, stretched him up towards the ceiling. Todd Bentley stepped back, bowed his head just for a second, ran up to the guy and kneed him in the stomach. And the guy bent over and crumpled to the floor. This is done all in the name of God. And all of these supposed prophets around Todd Bentley, like Peter Wagner, Paul Kane, Rick Joyner, Stacy Campbell, 
they all prophesied over him, said that a great revival was coming through Todd. An astonishing, astonishing lack of discernment. Dear friends, if you can't call into question somebody who says that God told him to kick an elderly woman in the face, if you can't call that into question, just what will you question? Now let's look at heavenly encounters. It almost seems like you're going to make it as a big time television preacher today. You had to have been to heaven at least once. And without a doubt, the most entertaining of all of the television preachers is Jesse Duplantis. And even though I know him to be, be a false teacher, when I watch him preach, I'll find myself chuckling sometimes. He's a very funny guy. He's very comical, very entertaining. What put Jesse on the map was this sermon he began preaching back in the mid-90s entitled Close Encounters of the God Kind. And in this message, Jesse Duplantis relates this fanciful tale about how he was caught up to heaven one day. And the story began, he said that he was um, having lunch with some other preachers there in the area. They were holding a meeting there. And they were waiting on their food, and all of a sudden, Jesse just felt burdened of the Lord to go back to his hotel room and pray. And finally, the, the food came down. It was placed in front of him. He couldn't bear it anymore. He said, man, I'm sorry. I've got to go. I've got to go. And so he got up, left left them, left food on the table, got back to his hotel, walked into his room, closed the door behind him, and he got down on his knees, and he said, Lord, what? And then right at that moment, Jesse says he was sucked out of his room and found himself on a cable car, no less, traveling through the cosmos at a phenomenal rate of speed. There was an angel on the cable car traveling along with him, and when the cable car finally came to a stop, the doors open, and Jesse steps out into heaven. And then Jesse goes on to tell you about everything that he saw, everything that he heard while he was in heaven. Now, our first concrete clue that something isn't quite right with Jesse's trip to heaven is what the angel on the cable car told him. The angel said to Jesse, you have an appointment with the great God Jehovah. This is our first concrete clue that something isn't quite right here. Now, I don't want to get too terribly technical with you, but Jehovah is not God's name. God's name is not Jehovah. His name is Yahweh, Y-H-W-H. Now, ancient Hebrew had no vowels. Uh, had no spaces between the words, had no punctuation, was, and was read from right to left. It's a bear to try to read ancient Hebrew. For, but for our purposes here, Y-H-W-H. Now, what happened about the year 1520 is that a German scholar by the name of Peter Galatinus took the consonants of Yahweh, and then he took another name for God, the name Adonai, which means ruler. These vowels were added later. But in essence, what Galatinus did is he took Yahweh and the vowels of Adonai, and he smushed them together. And when he smushed them together, this is what happened. Because of the Germanic influence, a Y is like our J. The A in Adonai is a short A and sometimes is expressed, written as an E. The H in Yahweh drops down, as does the O in Adonai. The W is like our V. And the final A in Adonai drops down, as does the final H. And voila, you have the name Jehovah. So Jehovah is not God's name. Now, is it a sin to call God Jehovah? No, I don't think it's a sin. I'm not even sure he really takes offense at it, but it's kind of like my name. My name's Justin, but a lot of people don't know me real well will call me Jason. I get called Jason a lot. And uh, do I take offense at that? No, I don't take offense at it, but if I had my druthers, I'd rather you call me Justin because that's my name. Maybe if God had his druthers, he would rather us call him by his real name, that is Yahweh. The point of the matter, however, is this, is that an angel would have known better. An angel would have known better. An angel would never have said you have an appointment with Jehovah. If anything, you would have said you have an appointment with Yahweh. So an angel would have known better, but apparently Jesse Duplantis did not. Watch this video clip from the same message. Listen very carefully to the terminology here that Jesse Duplantis uses. Just might sound familiar. I took my do not disturb, then a little thing, I put it on there, closed the door. It's one minute to one. I looked at the clock, you know, those digital clocks that hotels have. And I knelt down. I didn't know what though. I had no idea what. I said, in this position, like this, I don't know if you can see me or not. Just, and I said, Lord, what? And I was sucked out of my room. I heard this, and I went, I just, now I don't know whether I was in my body or out of my body. I believe I was in my body. Now I don't know whether I was in my body or out of my body. I believe I was in my body. Does that sound familiar? Does that ring a bell with anyone here? Well, if it does, there's a good reason for that because it's the exact same terminology that the Apostle Paul used in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Let's look at this. Verses 2 through 4, the Apostle Paul writes, 
I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in the body I don't know or out of the body I don't know, God knows, such a man was called up to the third heaven. And I know how such a man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know, God knows, was caught up into paradise and heard inexpressible words which a man is not permitted to speak. Notice the exact same terminology that the Apostle Paul used, Jesse Duplantis uses. And so what's Jesse doing? Jesse is trying to elevate his experience to the same authoritative level as that of Scripture. Do you know of whom the Apostle Paul was speaking in this passage? Who was Paul talking about? Himself. That's right, he's talking about himself. Well, you may be wondering, well, if he's talking about himself, why does he use the third person, not the first person? Well, the reason Paul does this is because that is how humbled he was by what he had experienced. Paul had this rapturous experience into paradise, third heaven, and he was so humbled by that, by that that he would not even refer to himself in the first person. He used the third person. And even with that level of humility, God still gave Paul a thorn in the flesh to humble him even further. And notice, too, what do we know about what the Apostle Paul saw and heard while he was in heaven? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. We have no idea what he saw, no idea what he heard. Because he heard words that are inexpressible, that man's not permitted to speak. Contrast that level of humility with Jesse Duplantis. And Jesse Duplantis just can't wait to tell you about everything that he saw, everything that he heard while he was in heaven. I don't know where Jesse went, but it was not to heaven. Jesse has made a mint off of selling you his books and selling you his videos. To give you an idea of how this movement is making inroads into our more conservative evangelical churches, a few years ago this video was shown to the uh, youth group at the largest Baptist church in my hometown of Vicksburg, Mississippi. They showed this to their youth group. Not as something for them to laugh at, by the way, but something from them to, uh, for them to supposedly learn from. An astonishing lack of discernment. Consider this video clip from the same uh, sermon and listen very carefully to what Jesus supposedly told Jesse while he was in heaven. He said, I chose you. He said, no one else wanted you. But I need you, boy. I need you, Jesse. Jesus told Jesse, I need you. This from Benny Hinn. I will never forget standing in a meeting worshiping the Lord and I felt a hand touch my arm and I looked and I said who touched me and there were some other young people with me in this service church service and said nobody touched you and I went back to worshiping God in a few seconds there was the hand again and I turned and said somebody touched me and they kind of looked at me it happened again and the third time when I opened my eyes they were all worshiping God with tears to be down their face, but I could still feel the hand. And I heard him speak to me and say, listen to this, the Lord said to me, I need you. Imagine God saying to you, I need you. Imagine indeed. Dear friends, I'll say this as gently, yet as clearly as I know how to say it. God loves us, but make no mistake about it. God does not need us. He is the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last, the wonderful counselor, almighty God, Prince of Peace. He has need of no one and no thing. God loves us, but he does not need us. We need him. And any man that's preaching a gospel that says that God needs us is preaching a different gospel. A different gospel. Some of the behavior in the faith movement can only be characterized as bizarre. And these clips will pretty much speak for themselves. We got back off of the platform, and after Benny had prayed for another half an hour or more for the staff and the other pastors that came backstage, we sat down to get a little bite to eat, and I'm, okay, now are you listening? Gold dust was all over Benny's face. And, and I, I actually got down close and tried to get some of it, and... And then I took a picture, the, the picture didn't turn out too well, it wasn't in good focus, but it was just sparkling all over his face. And where that gold dust came from had to be from another dimension. Well, you know what? Keep on worshiping, but I just want you to look as Sister Savannah has this gold that comes so that you can see it as well. It looks like it's silver and gold mixed tonight. Oh, oh, oh. 
she said to me a moment ago, there are about 300 angels in this place tonight. Keep worshiping Jesus. This is Brother Sid Roth. I told you God would visit us here tonight. I told you. Can you tell us what's happening to you? Can you talk to me? Can you... How can they? Oh. The thing is finished. <laughs> <laughs> Now, you say, I don't know, this is really far out tonight. Isn't that wonderful? You need to get far out. Seed for y'all. You know, just be that intercessor that God wants for the hurting, for the church, you know. And, and being hurt myself, it's like I couldn't do that to the full capacity. But last night when, when Chastity um, sang, you know, come running to the mercy. I want to offer a bit of a disclaimer before I show you the next video clip, and I want to say in intellectual honesty that not all of the faith preachers would endorse what you're about to see. Some would, but some wouldn't. Uh, but what you're about to see will show you the links to which this bizarre behavior can go. When we exceed what is written, when we remove ourselves from biblical parameters, what you're about to see will show you where it ends up. Something. Wait till they come to Boston. <laughs> Toronto. Leave us to ourselves. Don't leave us to yes. our foolish thinking. Lord, we want all that you have. All, yes. all that you have. Yes. And Lord, if it blows our little minds, let them be blown. <laughs> Father, we want all of what you have. All of what you have. We thank you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And he had a, God told me to look at him, and I looked at him, and he had a tie on, and on, I don't know if he's here tonight, but he'll know, on the tie had a wolf howling at the moon. And the Lord said to me, will you howl for me? I said, don't ask me to do that, Lord. He said, if I ask you, will you do it? He said, if I can't ask you to do something in your own house, how are you going to do it out there? So... You know, friends, I'm not sure exactly how long it takes to get to the point where you believe being led around on a leash is appropriate behavior for the house of God. I don't know just how long it takes to get there, but I can tell you where it starts. When you exceed what is written, when you exceed biblical parameters, when you do that, dear friends, you remove yourself from God's protection, open yourself up to demonic influence and demonic suggestion. That's where it starts. I want us to look now at a video clip uh, dealing with a phenomenon known as Holy Ghost Laughter. This was recorded at Rodney Howard Brown's church in Florida. Snickers, chuckles, side splitting, fall on the floor, belly laughs, all are welcome at this church. CNN's Tom Foreman checked out What's So Funny for AC360. On a warm night in Tampa, young people are out looking for laughs, but hundreds are bypassing comedy clubs to get their chuckles 
at church. <laughs> and guffaws. <laughs> roars. <laughs> screams. <laughs> all standard fare at the Laughing Church. <laughs> Where Dr. Rodney Howard Brown says the Holy Spirit is making folks out. They're laughing, they're crying, they're shaking, they're falling out the seats. I knew it had nothing to do with you. He arose, he ascended on high. This is worship for Reverend Howard Brown and his thousands of followers. He is coming back. He is coming back. King of kings and Lord of lords. Unlike other Pentecostal Christians who speak in tongues, these people say the joy of salvation makes them laugh uncontrollably. It's the Holy Spirit. A global outreach program based in America and staffed by 70 people, all enthralled with holy laughter. Well, the question that needs to be asked in evaluating this phenomenon is, is it a biblical practice? Is there any scriptural support for it? And dear friends, I want to tell you, in all my years of reading and studying God's Word, I haven't found anything in the Bible to support Holy Ghost laughter. In fact, when I look through the Bible and I find examples of people who find themselves in the presence of God, what I tend to see are people who are made all too well aware of the great gulf that exists between God's holiness and their sin. What did Isaiah say? He said, Woe is me, for I am ruined. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. I find people who are made all too well aware of the great gulf between God's holiness and their sin. I don't see anybody in Scripture getting their chuckles off of the King of Glory. Now I want us to look at a practice known as being slain in the Spirit. Probably all of you have seen this either on television, possibly even in person. Just a few brief clips to illustrate this practice. This is your brace. A touch from the hand of Pastor Benny Hinn and believers are overcome by the presence of the Lord. So strong is the feeling, they fall even if he just blows into the microphone. It's known as slaying in the spirit. Hinn prefers to call it falling under the power of God. His critics, even those who believe in faith healing, say it's not the power of God, but the power of suggestion that makes people swoon. The people are worked up into a frenzy, they know what's expected of them, and they do it. I think it is theatrical, and I think it is a gimmick. <laughs> are right words. Witness now how unclean spirits flee when the Reverend Hen approaches. Somebody says, why do you blow on people? I don't know. I just know that the Holy Spirit says do it. And you know what? It worth them. Well, as with Holy Ghost laughter, the question that needs to be asked is, is this a biblical practice? Is there any scriptural support for it? And the faith preachers would say, yes, there is. And they would appeal to a couple of texts in particular, and I would like us to look at these. One of them is Matthew chapter 17. This is when Jesus was being transfigured. And while Jesus yet spake, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. And when the disciples heard this, they fell face down to the ground and were sore afraid. And the faith preachers would say, see, here were the disciples, they were in the presence of God, and they fell. Well, yeah, they did, but there's a couple of points I think we need to make here. Number one, in all likelihood, the disciples were not knocked down. They voluntarily lowered themselves down. And number two, which direction did the disciples go down? Face forward. Which direction do we see people fall when they're slain in the Spirit? Backwards. Hmm. Well, that one won't work. Well, they'll say, what about John chapter 18? This is when Jesus was being arrested. So Jesus, knowing all the things that were coming upon him, went forth and said to them, Whom do you seek? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. He said to them, I am. So when he said to them, I am, that he is not really in the Greek, it's just applied. They drew back and fell to the ground. And the faith preachers would say, See, here were these men, and they were in the presence of God. Not only did they fall, but they even fell backwards. And they did. But let's be intellectually honest here. Who were these people that were doing the falling? Were these believers? No. These were the Roman soldiers coming to arrest Jesus. 
So this passage can hardly be taken as biblical support for a normative practice for us today. In fact, it's interesting. You can look through the Bible and find a number of examples of people who are in the presence of God and they fell in worship. David did so. Uh, the disciples here in Matthew 17 did so. John did so in Revelation. But without exception, they always fall forwards. They always lower themselves forward. Anytime somebody in Scripture finds themselves in the presence of God and they fall backwards, it's always in judgment. This is not an experience after which I would be seeking. Friends, one of the fundamental problems of the faith movement is that those who teach it and those who follow it interpret the Bible by what they experience rather than interpreting their experiences by the Bible, which is how it should be. Friends, no matter how real an experience may seem to us, if that experience does not plumb with God's Word, then it's an illegitimate experience. We've exceeded what is written, we've exceeded biblical parameters, and in so doing, we open ourselves up to demonic influence and demonic suggestion. I believe the vast majority of people who are slain in the Spirit, uh, it's just peer pressure, it's group dynamics, mind over body. That having been said, however, I do believe that at times there are spiritual forces at work, but they are not of God. I think a lot of these, especially the more extreme examples that was going on in Todd Bentley's meetings and people barking, and I mean, I saw all kinds of things. I believe a lot of that, the vast majority of it, probably demonic. Now let's look at divine revelation knowledge. All of the faith preachers claim that much of what they teach you, they receive directly from divine revelation knowledge, a super special knowledge apart from the scriptures. Now, divine revelation knowledge, as the term, was first coined by Essek W. Kenyon, the grandfather of this movement. Kenyon believed in two types of knowledge. The first of these is sensory knowledge, that which we get through our five senses, sight, sound, taste, smell, so forth. And the other is revelation knowledge. This is supernatural knowledge that comes only from God. Now, according to Kenyon, the catch here is that these two spheres of knowledge are mutually exclusive. And what that means is, is that reasoning or logical thought is of no value. So in other words, if you really want to go deeper with the Lord, if you really want to go into the deep, secret things of God, you've got to disengage rational thought. Put the old noodle up here in a park. Is that what the Bible tells us to do? No. Jesus said to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, and mind. The Bible says we are to study, to show ourselves approved unto God. So even though Kenyon was the one that first coined the term, the idea itself was not new to Kenyon, far from it. The idea goes back to an ancient heresy known as Gnosticism. The Gnostics derived their name from the Greek word gnosis, which means knowledge. And the Gnostics also believed in secret and divine revelation knowledge through which you could obtain salvation. But to get this knowledge, you had to disengage rational thought, open yourself up to just emotional whims. And, and you see this, it began in Gnosticism, but you see it today in the emergent movement. You see it in the contemplative movement. You see it in the Word of Faith movement. Same basic error. It just rears itself up, pops up in different places, manifests itself in different ways. Consider this audio clip from Benny Hinn. Adam was a super being when God created him. I don't know whether people even know this, but he was the first superman that really ever lived. First of all, the scriptures declare clearly that he had dominion over the fowls of the air, the fish of the sea, which means he used to fly. Whoa. Well, of course, how can you have dominion over the birds and not be able to do what they do? Whoa. Actually, I mean, the, wait a minute. I, wait. I'll prove it to you. Wait a minute, Danny. I've never heard that. The word um, dominion yes. in the Hebrew clearly declares that if you have dominion over a subject, that you do everything that subject does. In other words, that subject, if it does something you, you cannot do, you don't have dominion over it. I'll prove it further. Adam not only flew, he flew to space. He used to be, he, 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 he was with one thought, he'd be on the moon. Using Benny Hinn's logic, we might also wonder if Adam was able to shed his skin like a snake, lay an egg like a chicken, or photosynthesize like a magnolia tree. You see how utterly ridiculous this is. However, Benny Hinn's revelation knowledge does get much more serious and much more heretical. This is what he told his church at the time, which was in Orlando, Florida. Benny Hinn said, I want you all to look at me and I want you all to listen carefully to what I'm going to say. This was put to the test by three theologians who read my book because it's in my book. It's not a very easy thing to understand, but let's pray that the Holy Ghost will help all of us. Man, I feel revelation knowledge already coming on me. I want you to lift your hands. Something new is going to happen here today. Holy Spirit, take over in the name of Jesus. Ladies and gentlemen, are you here to learn? 
God the Father, ladies and gentlemen, is a person and he is a triune being by himself, separate from the Son and the Holy Ghost. What did you say? Hear it, hear it. God the Father is a person, God the Son is a person, God the Holy Ghost is a person, but each one of them is a triune being by himself. If I can shock you, and maybe I should, there's nine of them. You say, oh, I never heard that. Well, you think you're in this church to hear things you've heard for the last 50 years? So, under divine revelation knowledge, Benny Hinn is teaching a nine-member Godhead. Friends, God will never, under any circumstances, tell us anything that contradicts his word. And a nine-member Godhead contradicts his word. That's heretical. Have you ever stopped to think about how many false religions have begun by a single individual coming along the scene and saying, Oh, God spoke to me. Let me tell you what he said. Numerous, myriads of false religions. But two big ones come to my mind right off the bat. Mormonism and Islam. It's interesting, both Joseph Smith and Muhammad of Mormonism and Islam respectively. You read the writings of these men. Both of these men were by themselves, completely removed from other people, and this being appeared to them and gave them new revelations. And when you read their writings, both of these men initially struggled with whether this might be a demon. They thought initially it was a demon. And then they became convinced that no, it was really an angel from God. And so you have two huge false religions that were begun in very, very eerily similar fashions. And I can't prove this, it's just my own working theory, you know. Thus saith Justin, not thus saith the Lord. I just, it's my theory that it may have been the same angel, I mean, excuse me, the same demon that appeared to both of these men. Divine revelation knowledge. Uh, consider this also divine revelation knowledge from Benny Hinn, but this a little bit on the lighter side. The Holy Spirit said something to me, and I had to go like a madman looking in the words. He says, God's original plan is that the woman was to bring forth children out of her side. Now, that's not particularly heretical, I don't suppose. That's just stupid. But Benny Hinn said that the Holy Spirit told him this, that women were supposed to give birth out of their sides. And I learned this just a couple of years ago. That's actually the, the legend of Buddha. According to the legend of Buddha, Buddha's mother gave birth to him out of her side when he was two years old, which I would think would leave just a terrible scar. But at any rate, that's the legend of Buddha. He didn't get that from the Holy Spirit. Consider this text, Hebrews 1, 1 and 2. God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. The writer of Hebrews says that God in the Old Testament spoke in a lot of different ways. You know, he spoke to Moses up on the mountain through a storm and thunder. He spoke to Elijah through a still small voice. In Numbers chapter 22, God even made a donkey talk. So God did indeed speak in many different portions and in many different ways. But in these last days, says the writer of Hebrews, God has spoken to us in his Son. Dear friends, Jesus is the final speaking of God the final speaking of God. Everything that God has to say to us about himself, his character, and his nature, he has said in his Son, Jesus Christ, and we have a perfect, infallible, and errant, all sufficient record, sufficient record of that in his word. Jesus is the final speaking of God. Now, please don't misunderstand me. I don't want anybody to leave here and think, oh my goodness, Justin told us that God doesn't talk to us anymore. Yes, he does. This is the primary way God speaks to us. And God will speak to us through the convicting power of His Holy Spirit, through His Word, to convict us of sin, to convict us of, of righteousness and judgment. God will give us wisdom. But God always speaks through His Word, friends. And God is not revealing anything new about Himself, His character and His nature that is not already revealed in His Word. One of my favorite hymns, How Firm a Foundation. How firm a foundation, ye saints of the Lord, is laid for your faith in what? In his excellent word. What more can he say than to you he hath said? To you who for refuge to Jesus hath fled. What more can God say to us, dear friends, than what he has already said in his word? Sadly, some of the faith preachers even delve into the realm of the occult and the demonic. 
The Spirit explicitly says that in the latter times some will fall away from the faith, giving heed to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. Listen to the following audio clip of Kenneth Copeland. Suddenly I began to be aware that my body, that my spirit is coming out of my body. And, and it, it scared me, and, and I, man, I, I grabbed hold of it with my will and wouldn't let it go. He said the day you were down there in such and such town, standing over there behind that curtain, and your spirit started coming out of your body, and you jerked back like that and thought you was dying, and you let fear get hold of you, and I remember I did. I said, well, God, I mean, <laughs> really, now, is this what kind of a horse do you think I am? That they're not going to... You know, at least give you a few chills to stand there and die. He says, you weren't dying. I said, what do you mean I wasn't dying? My spirit was coming out of my body. He said, that's right. You were fixing. He said, you were just about to come out of your body, and I was going to allow you to minister to that congregation without your body. You were going to go through that congregation like a whirlwind of the power and the glory of God. I said, you let's show me that in the scripture. He said, and he showed me 2 Corinthians chapter 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. He said, you missed that opportunity for that experience. I said, what was I going to do? He said, I'm not going to tell you. You missed it. Can I have a second chance? <laughs> now, aside from just absolutely giving you the willies about a disembodied Kenneth Copeland moving through the congregation, friends, I don't want a disembodied anybody moving through me, much less Kenneth Copeland. But friends, that is foreign to the Word of God. And no, Mr. Copeland, it's not in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. It's not there. Anything, that is demonic. Benny Hinn readily admits that his model in ministry is the late Catherine Kuhlman. Some of you may remember Catherine Kuhlman. She was a faith healer, died in the mid-70s. Though Benny Hinn never met her personally, uh, he was a great admirer of hers and studied her. And uh, just a brief clip to remind you of who Catherine Kuhlman was. And everything that you and I receive must come through Jesus. Hinn says he is a disciple of the late Catherine Kuhlman a famous spiritual healer in the early days of television. The power of God going through this. That's power. If you look at his performance, his shtick, and you look at Catherine Kuhlman, they're the same person. Praise the Lord, will you? Except he's got a white suit and she's got a white dress. I mean, he's ate all of Catherine Kuhlman's mannerisms. Pick him up high. Pick him up high. Pick up your legs. Up and down. Up, up, up. Uh, so fond of Catherine Kuhlman is Benny Hinn that not even the grave has kept her from visiting him. Necromancy is defined as the special mode of obtaining aid or knowledge by the conjuration of the dead. And Benny Hinn, on several occasions, readily admits that Catherine Kuhlman has been appearing to him, visiting him, to give him instruction and direction in his ministry. What does the Bible have to say about this? Well, the one guilty of necromancy is detestable before the Lord and even subject to the death penalty. This is not a sin which God takes lightly. Dear friends, we should not be talking to dead people. The Bible explicitly condemns this. And yet Benny Hinn, and he's not alone by the way, Jesse Duplantis also, they readily admit to talking to dead people. And uh, I heard Jesse Duplantis in person encourage all those who are in attendance to get in touch with their dead, dead loved ones, to get wisdom and get comfort from their dead loved ones. Astonishing to me that these people who claim to be some of our leaders readily admit to engaging in activity that's explicitly condemned by the scriptures. Our final section in this session is entitled False Prophets. How can you tell a false prophet? Well, the following list is not exhaustive, but it does hit just a couple of the high points. Number one, if a man or a woman worships or prophesies in the name of any God other than Yahweh, then he or she is a false prophet. Now, the faith preachers do not do this explicitly in the sense they don't prophesy in the name of Baal or something like that. But we've already seen how Benny Hinn gets spiritual direction uh, from witches, and we've seen how the faith preachers teach a different Jesus, and if they teach a different Jesus, they meet this criterion. Another is if a man or woman habitually displays questionable moral character, then he or she cannot speak for God. I could have an entire seminar, literally, an entire seminar devoted to just the lies that Benny Hinn has told about major events in his own life and ministry. Just on that, he really has a problem with the truth, to put it charitably. Uh, 
has questionable moral character and knowingly claims people to be healed that he knows are not healed. He has a problem with character and integrity. One of the easiest ways to tell a false prophet is if a prophet offers prophecies that just do not come true. Now this might sound deceptively uh, easy to ascertain, but sometimes when these prophets will offer a prophecy, they won't put a time frame on it. And so when it never seems to happen, they'll say, oh, I just meant that for you know, years down the road. I didn't mean that for any time here. Uh, but sometimes they do give us time frames for their prophecies and make it a lot easier. I want to look at one prophecy that I discovered from Kenneth Copeland just about a year ago. He offered this at the end of 1994, the beginning of 1995. In those couple of months there, this is what Kenneth Copeland prophesied. He wrote it in his magazine, Believer's Voice of Victory. He said, and we're going to see the move of God like we've never seen it before because you mark my word, 1995 is the beginning of the beyond what we are able to ask or think. Every year has a name. 1995 is that beginning. It has come. There are many Muslims that while they are trying to worship what they think is God, Jesus is going to appear right in the middle of it. And under the influence of the power of the Holy Ghost, Islam will fall. Islam will become nothing. Well, we all know how that prophecy turned out now, don't we? And I'll give you three guesses, and two of them don't count, as to what is the fastest growing religion in the United States of America. And it ain't Christianity. Islam. The following audio clip was recorded on December the 31st, 1989 at Benny Hinn's church, which at the time was in Orlando, Florida. You can listen to this audio tape, which I have of Benny Hinn. And on, in this New Year's Eve service, December the 31st, 1989, Benny Hinn goes into a trance. And in this trance, he begins to offer prophecies that were supposed to come true in the 1990s, in the upcoming decade of the 1990s. And you can hear Benny Hinn on this tape, and after he rattles off a number of these prophecies, then he kind of snaps out of it, and he, he, go, he kind of comes to his senses, he says, Ooh, ooh, I have no idea what I just said. No idea. Did, did you take that? Did, did you take that, brother? Well, unfortunately for him, someone did. And so let's listen to these prophecies and see how many of them he got right. The Spirit of God tells me an earthquake will hit the east coast of America and destroy much in the 90s. Not one place would be safe from earthquakes in the 90s. These who have not known earthquakes will know it. People, I feel the Spirit all over me. I'm not God. The economy of the United States of America is going to fall. Many businesses will go bankrupt. The spread tells me Peter Castro will die in the nanny. Oh my. The spread tells me that the church, once raptured, following the rapture, a woman president will be in the White House. And that woman president will destroy this nation. But my church will, will be gone. My saints will be home. A world dictator is coming on the scene. My. He's a short man. He's a short man. I see a short man who's the perfect incarnation of Satan. The Lord also tells me to tell you in the mid 90s, about 94, 95, no later than that, God will destroy the homosexual community of America. But He will not destroy it with what many minds have thought Him to be, He will destroy it with fire. And many will turn and be saved, and many will rebel and be destroyed. One, two, three, four, five, six strikes, you're out. This is by no means exhaustive of Benny Hinn's false prophecies. This is just all he managed on one particular night. Friends, you can look at every biblical criterion as to how to discern a false prophet. And these individuals meet each and every one of them. At some point, one must call a spade a spade. I take no joy in this. I wish this seminar was not even necessary. But uh, unfortunately, it is. But again, my desire is that this seminar will help equip you 
to do what Ephesians 4.15 tells us to do, and that is to speak the truth in love, lovingly and gently, yet with biblical conviction, guide people away from a different gospel. Session number three, entitled The Herd of Healing. And as I said, whereas the issues that we look at in sessions one or two are more heretical from a doctrinal standpoint, nothing is more harmful to people from a practical and a pastoral standpoint than what the faith preachers teach about divine physical healing. This touches all of us. We either need healing ourselves or we have a loved one who does. There are some things I want us to consider, some points to ponder, if you'd like to alliterate it a little bit. Just kind of in a general nature, dealing with miracles and healing. Number one, large numbers are not necessarily indicative of God's blessing or approval. This movement is large and it is growing, but just because it's growing does not necessarily mean that God is the source of that growth. That's far too simplistic logic. If that were sound logic, then we would have to say God is giving his blessing and approval to Islam because Islam is the fastest growing religion in the United States of America. So just because a movement or a church for that matter is growing does not necessarily mean that God is the source of that growth. False prophets are not going to look like false prophets. The Bible tells us that Satan disguises himself as an angel of light, as a wolf in sheep's clothing. Dear friends, Satan is not going to show up to us red and scaly with a bifurcated tail carrying a hay fork. He's smarter than that. He's going to disguise himself as an angel of light. He will have some truth, but he will mix in with that truth, error and heresy, to corrupt the whole thing. And the Bible tells us that a little leaven leavens the whole lump. The ability to do miracles is not necessarily a sign that God is the source. The faith preachers say, well, we have this inordinate emphasis on miracles because miracles are what prove that the gospel of Jesus is true and all other religions are false. Uh, this is also faulty logic. Consider this video clip from Benny Hinn. If the gospel doesn't have, if the gospel lacks, if the preaching of the gospel lacks signs and wonders, it's an empty shell. If the preaching of the gospel lacks signs and wonders, it's an empty shell. Friends, that is heresy. What does the Apostle Paul say? Paul says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, from Jew first and also to the Greek. What is the power of God? The gospel is, as it is read and as it is preached from God's word. I do believe in miracles, but miracles do not have the power in and of themselves to convict men of sin, righteousness, and judgment. The gospel of Christ does. When I was a little boy, I prayed for my healing because I wanted to walk. You know, I want to be able to play football, do all those things that I thought were so important. As I entered into my early adult life, though, I still prayed for my healing, but I can honestly tell you my motives changed. I no longer, longer prayed for my healing just so that I could walk. I prayed for my healing because all I could think about is what a powerful testimony that would be. If all of a sudden I were to show up walking, you know, there is no cure for cerebral palsy. Once you got it, you got it, unless God does something. So if I were to just show up one day walking, there would be no other explanation for my healing other than God. And I could just see myself going, you know, and getting into visualization stuff here, but I could just see myself going into, you know, going all across the country and packing out big old coliseums and, and just having multitudes of people come to know Christ because of the great demonstration of God's power in my life. But then I came to a text of scripture that really, once I understood it, it really it, it totally changed my thinking on this. And that text was Luke chapter 16. You'll remember with me the account that Jesus gave of the rich man and Lazarus, both of whom died. And I do believe this was a real event in history. I don't think this is just a parable. This really happened. But the rich man and Lazarus both died. The rich man went to the place of torment. Lazarus went to Abraham's bosom. And by the way, the rich man did not go to the place of torment because he was rich. Lazarus did not go to Abraham's bosom because he was poor. Each man went where he was spiritually prepared to go. But to paraphrase this story, both men died. The rich man woke up in the place of torment, and he apparently could see across this great chasm Abraham and Lazarus there beside him in his bosom. And he, he looked across, and he said, he cried out. He said, Father Abraham, send Lazarus to my five brothers and warn them not to come to this place. And what did Abraham say? They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. Moses and the prophets have been dead for centuries. How could they possibly hear Moses and the prophets? This is how. And what did the rich man say? He said, no, Father Abraham, but if somebody were to go back from the dead, then they'll believe. 
Abraham said, if they will not hear Moses, if they will not hear the prophets, neither will they believe, even if somebody were to come back from the dead. Dear friends, I do believe in miracles. The greatest miracle of all is that of salvation. But there is an inherent power in God's Word that is not even found in miracles. God could turn me into Olympic, an Olympic gold medal winning gymnast right now. But if people will not hear Moses, if they will not hear the prophets, neither will they respond, even if God were to do that. The power to convict men and to save men is in the Word of God. In the Word of God alone. The ability to do miracles is not necessarily a sign that God is the source. Jesus' own words. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and in your name cast out demons, and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Jesus is very clear that there will be many on that day, and they'll say, Lord, we prophesied in your name. In your name we cast out demons. We perform many miracles, all in your name. Jesus said, I never knew you. Depart from me. What a terrifying passage of Scripture. Dear friends, just because somebody has the apparent ability to perform a sign and wonder does not necessarily mean that that ability is coming from God. Let us remember that when Moses and Aaron were before the Egyptian court, Aaron cast down his staff on the floor and it became a serpent. Apparently, the Egyptian magicians could do the very same thing. They even turned the Nile River into blood. There is an ability to counterfeit miracles. Satan does have that power. Now, Satan's power is limited. He's on a leash, and God's holding the other end of that leash. But he does have power to counterfeit signs and wonders. Now let's get into the meat of the matter. Physical healing. Is it always God's will? The faith preachers say, yes, it is. Benny Hinn says, he promises to heal all, everyone, any whatsoever, everything, all our diseases. That means not even a headache, sinus problem, not even a toothache, nothing. No sickness should come your way. God heals all your diseases. The faith preachers make no bones about it. We should never be sick. Or in the unlikely event we do get sick, physical healing is guaranteed, as long as we have enough faith. This from Fred Price. When I first got saved, they didn't tell me I could do anything. They just, what they told me to do is that whenever I prayed, I should always say the will of the Lord be done. Now, doesn't that sound humble? It does. It sounds like humility. It's really stupidity. I mean, you know, you, you, you really, we, we insult God. I mean, we really do insult our Heavenly Father. We do. We, we, we really insult Him without even realizing it. If you have to say that, if it be thy will or thy will be done, if you have to say that, then you're calling God a fool. Never mind that Jesus himself in the garden prayed, Father, let this cup pass from me, but not my will, but thine be done. You see the incredible arrogance of the faith preachers. This from Rod Parsley, pastor in Columbus, Ohio. Rod Parsley writes in his book, Calvary's Double Cure, the deceiving spirit of the Antichrist that contends that sin is okay is the same spirit that generates the lie that maybe God will heal sometime. The devil has stolen the doctrinal truth of divine healing out of the body of Christ. So if you are here to this, this afternoon and you, like me, are someone who believes that it is sometimes God's will for a person to be physically healed, then you and I have the spirit of the Antichrist. I appreciate that, Rod. This from Gloria Copeland. You could take that one psalm right there and you could do away with the tradition that says, Lord, if it be thy will, heal him. Don't even bother to pray for me if you're going to pray that. If you don't know enough about the Word of God to know it's God's will to heal, you can't pray the prayer of faith, and so you might as well just stay home. So if you believe it's sometimes God's will for a person to be healed, maybe not all the time, you can't even pray. You may as well just stay home. Unreal. Dear friends, if you begin with the premise that healing is guaranteed, and a person prays for that healing for days, weeks, months, years, sometimes decades, and the healing does not come, then the question must be asked, whose fault is it? By definition, it cannot be God's fault, because he's perfect. The only other one then to whom to look is the one who's sick. It's his fault or her fault, because he doesn't have enough faith, has unconfessed sin in his or her life, hasn't given enough money to the ministry, or maybe you're not even saved. And lest you think I overstate their case, this from her husband, Kenneth Copeland. Well, I don't understand why God healed them and he won't heal me. Could it be? 
by some stretch of the imagination. Oh, probably not, but could it be? That is your fault, not God's. <laughs> oh yeah. Say it, oh yeah. <laughs> Lest there be any doubt as to their position. Again, friends, if you begin with the premise that healing is guaranteed, and you pray for that healing, but it never comes, you can wordsmith it all day long, you can pontificate on it till the cows come home, but the fault always lies squarely at the foot of the sick believer. There's no other conclusion which can be drawn. Is there any scriptural support, any proof text, if you will, to which the faith preachers would appeal to substantiate their teaching that physical healing is always God's will? Well, there are a few verses that they would appeal to, and I'd like us to look at a few of these. One of these, amazingly enough, is Ephesians 5.23. This is what Benny Hinn writes about this verse. Benny Hinn says, And now the Bible says in Ephesians 5.23 that Jesus Christ is the Savior of the body. He is not only the Savior of the soul, He is the Savior of the body. Ladies and gentlemen, you can cry out, You are the Savior of my body, Lord Jesus. You are the Savior of my soul. If Jesus Christ is the Savior of the body, then your body ought to be made whole. Sounds logical, doesn't it? It does. That is, until you actually read Ephesians 5.23. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the savior of the body. One need not be a Greek scholar to know that the body in Ephesians 5.23 is not talking about your flesh and blood body. It's talking about the church. And this kind of Mickey Mouse hermeneutics, this kind of Mickey Mouse Bible interpretation would be laughable, comical, if it weren't that it were leading so very many people astray. Benny Hinn ought to be embarrassed by that. Another one of their proof texts is... 3 John 2. This is one of their favorites. This is almost like their gold standard. Beloved, I pray that in all you may prosper and be in good health, even as your soul prospers. 3 John 2 says, Beloved, I pray that you might prosper in every way, and that your body might keep well, even as I know your soul prospers and keeps well. Now that's a very wonderful scripture. I pray that you would prosper in every way. So he talks about prosperity. He says, I would that you prosper and be in health. And be in health. So we see right there that God wants us to be healthy. Can everybody say, God wants me to be healthy? I'm going to say something that may at first sound a bit odd. Please bear with me. It is possible to over-spiritualize parts of the Bible. Okay? It's, it's possible to over-spiritualize parts of the Bible. And to take, take 3 John 2 as a blanket promise for guaranteed healing and guaranteed wealth is over-spiritualizing this verse. Basically, John is writing a letter to his friend Gaius. And John opens his letter in much the same way that you and I might open a letter that we write to one of our friends today. Basically, John's saying this, Dear Gaius, I hope that this finds you doing well. Friends, that's all in the world he's saying. This is just a common greeting to a letter. This is not a statement of theology. This is not a doctrinal statement. It's just a greeting to a letter. And the faith preachers know it, or they should know it. But they don't want you to know it, because it happens to fit their theology. Foundational to the faith preacher's teaching that physical healing is guaranteed is their teaching that healing is provided for in the atonement. The atonement, of course, is that word which we give to the work that Jesus did for us on the cross. Sadly, we've seen how the faith preachers put that not on the cross, but in hell. We've already dealt with that. But they would all appeal to Isaiah 53, 4, and 5, which says this, Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. And the faith preachers will take this messianic passage, which um, they appeal to, and they'll look at these two words that I have highlighted here, griefs and sorrows, and they'll say that another way to render these two words is as sickness and pain, respectively. And you know what? They're right. They're right. Like many words in Hebrew, these two words have multiple possible renderings. So how do you know which rendering is correct? You know which rendering is correct by the context of the passage. And I'd like us to look at the context of the passage. It comes, comes very clear in the very next verse. Verse 5, Isaiah continues and says, But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Very clearly, the context of Isaiah 53 is not physical healing. It's spiritual healing. Healing from sin, not healing from sickness and disease. We see that from these two words, transgressions and iniquities. Yet how many times have you heard Benny Hinn or one of these other prosperity preachers say, by his stripes, you are healed, so you ought to be physically healed. 
No, the context is not physical healing, it is spiritual healing, healing from sin. And another way we can know that is we can ask the question, did any of the New Testament writers appeal to Isaiah 53? And indeed they did. Peter appeals to it when he writes, and he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, not in his soul in hell, by the way, so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. For by his stripes you were healed. Very clearly, Peter cites Isaiah 53 in the context of spiritual healing, healing from sin, not sickness and disease. Now, I do want to be intellectually honest and tell you that there is one New Testament writer that appeals to Isaiah 53 apparently in the context of physical healing. Matthew does so in Matthew chapter 8 when he records Jesus' healing of Peter's mother-in-law. And Matthew says that it was done in order that what was spoken through Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled, saying, He himself took our infirmities and carried our diseases. Well, Matthew does apparently cite Isaiah 53 in the context of physical healing. So, uh, what are we to do with this? Well, it's very important to let Scripture interpret Scripture. When Jesus came to this earth, his primary mission was not to heal people of their sickness and disease. His primary mission was to make atonement for their sins. And so everything that Jesus did always has to be viewed in the broader context of him making provision for people's sins. Everything that he did was related to that, whether it was turning the water into wine or walking on the water or raising the dead. It was always in the broader context of making provision for their sin. Even when he healed people, it was to make a statement about his mission of forgiving people of their sins. And we can see that illustrated in the very next chapter, Matthew chapter 9, when Jesus healed a man who was paralyzed. And he said, But in order that you may know that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to do what? To forgive sins. Then he said to the paralytic, Rise, take up your bed, and go home. Did you know that there was never a single time when Jesus healed anyone just so that that person could have an easier life? Jesus never healed anybody just so that that person could be more comfortable. Jesus always healed with the broader context, the broader view in mind of making a statement about who he was and what he was primarily about. And that was forgiving people of their sins. He said, but in order that you may know that the Son of Man is the authority on earth to forgive sins, rise, take up your bed, and go home. So, what is the answer to our question? Is physical healing provided for in the atonement? I might surprise you with my answer. Yes. Yes, it is. In the grand scheme of things, the reason I have cerebral palsy is a result of sin. Not my personal sin, but the sin of Adam and Eve. When Adam and Eve ate of that fruit, and by the way, we don't know it was an apple. It could have been an apricot for all we know. But when Adam and Eve ate of that fruit, when they sinned, they disobeyed God. Not only did sin enter the world, so did sickness and disease. It's one of the consequences of living in a fallen world. The reason many of you today are wearing eyeglasses, that's a result of sin. Not your personal sin, but the sin of Adam and Eve. Next time you catch a cold, you can blame Adam and Eve for that. It's just one of the consequences of living in a fallen world. So when Jesus came and died on the cross, he paid for our sins. He also paid for all of the consequences of those sins, one of which is sickness and disease. So, yes, our healing has been provided for in the atonement. But here's where the faith preachers get it very wrong. Not all of the benefits of the atonement are promised to be fully realized this side of heaven. Not all the benefits of the atonement are promised to be fully realized this side of heaven. Some of the benefits of Jesus' atonement are not promised to be realized until the other side of heaven. And healing from sickness and disease is one of those benefits. Uh, to give you another illustration, um, a glorified body is also provided for in the atonement. And no offense to anybody here, but I don't see anybody here today walking around with their glorified bodies. I've known a few people vain enough to think they have their glorified bodies, but I promise you they don't. It's provided for in the atonement, but not promised to be realized here. When I die and I go to heaven, I'm not taking my crutches with me. I'm not going to need them because my healing has been provided for in the atonement. But to be real honest with you, when I die and I go to heaven and I'm in the presence of God, I'm not sure it's even going to cross my mind that I can walk. I'm not sure it's even going to dawn on me that I no longer have my crutches because I'm going to have better things to think about. I am going to be in perfect worship of, fellowship with, 
and service to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. I'm not sure it's even crossed my mind that all of a sudden I can walk. I have better things to think about. Praise be His name. Praise be His name. So dear friend, take heart. Your healing has been provided for. But you may not realize it here. Don't worry. You will over there. What of the biblical record? Can we look through the Bible and find examples of people who loved the Lord and served Him faithfully yet did not walk in perfect health? Absolutely. Trophimus was left sick at Miletus. Epaphroditus was sick to the point of death. The Apostle Paul encouraged Timothy to take a little wine for his stomach in his frequent ailments. And I find this one particularly interesting because the Apostle Paul and Timothy were traveling companions. And if Paul could heal people at will, just like you turn on and off the light switch, I find it very interesting that he somehow saw the need to tell Timothy to take a little wine for his stomach in his frequent ailments. Job. Job is the theological elephant sitting in the living room of the faith preachers, <laughs> none of whom want to admit is there. Job's a problem for the prosperity gospel. Because here you have a man who was upright and righteous, hadn't done anything wrong, and yet God still allowed Satan to come and strike from Job everything that he had. His family, his possessions, and ultimately his own health. Job's a problem for the faith preachers, and they know it. And so they have to get around old Job, and the way they'll do it is they'll say, well, all of these things that befell Job, you see, those were all the results of his negative confessions. Job spoke negative things. And because of those negative confessions, all these calamities came upon Job. Poor old Job, it was all his fault. The Apostle Paul himself suffered from a thorn in the flesh. Let's look at this. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 and 9. The Apostle Paul says, And lest I should be exalted above measure because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, what revelations are these? The revelations that the Apostle Paul spoke of in verses 2 through 4, where he said that he was caught up to the third heaven but heard inexpressible words that man is not permitted to speak. Those revelations. For this reason there was given me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan, to buffet me, to keep me from exalting myself. Concerning this thorn, I entreated the Lord three times that it might depart from me. The Apostle Paul had some kind of thorn in the flesh. Um, what was that thorn? We don't know. Scholars have been debating about the identity of this thorn for centuries. In fact, the matter is, we just don't know what it was. I do believe it was something physical. Now, the prosperity preachers would say, no, that was just symbolic of those people who opposed him in his ministry, symbolic of his persecution. And that, I will say that idea has some merit. I won't discount it totally. But I'll share with you why I don't think it's the right view. Uh, number one, the Apostle Paul said it was a thorn in the sarx, the Greek word for flesh. And number two, when was it that the Apostle Paul seemed to thrive? When was it that he seemed to be at the top of his game? It was when he was being persecuted. Paul wrote some of his best stuff sitting in a prison cell. So I would think it would be quite uncharacteristic of Paul to all of a sudden pray for the removal of the very thing upon which he seemed to thrive. So um, I don't think that that's right, the right view. But, you know, playing devil's advocate, if this is not convincing enough for the faith preachers, and of course, the faith preacher said we should always be wealthy and, you know, always be blessed. So whatever the identity of the thorn is, it still goes against their theology. But um, if they don't think that was something physical, then I would say, okay, flip over to Galatians chapter 4. When Paul writes, but you know that it was because of a bodily illness that I preached the gospel to you the first time. And that which was a trial to you in my bodily condition, you did not despise or loathe, but you received me as an angel of God, as Christ Jesus himself. Paul writes that he definitely had a bodily illness. And look at how the Galatians responded to him. Oh, that the faith preachers had the same gracious attitude toward the afflicted believer as did the Galatians towards the Apostle Paul. Elisha had a double portion anointing of the great prophet Elijah, yet we read in 2 Kings 13 that Elisha was fallen sick of his sickness whereof he died. Dear friends, it's a matter of biblical record that not everyone who loved the Lord and served him faithfully walked in perfect divine health. It's not a matter of opinion. It's not up for debate. It's just a matter of biblical record. If it is always God's will to be healed, according to the faith preachers, are there any requirements to receive this healing? Yes. Faith preachers say there are requirements, and one of these requirements is that you must have a sense of expectation. You have to believe that your miracle is on its way. You have to believe, Lord, I know you're going to heal me. It is your will to do it. I'm expecting it. I'm ready to receive it. Have at it. Watch the following video clips and watch how very good the faith preachers are at 
whipping people up into emotional frenzies we're in there when they're in a state of expecting the miraculous to come that it's just around the corner for God to make me sound whole delivered saved heal now it is the will of God for me to be healed and to live a long life and I and say Lord Jesus just speak the word one more time speak the word say it again say it again say it again say Lord Jesus just speak the word and I will be healed I want you just to lift your hands and say, Holy Spirit, I welcome you with all of my heart. I welcome you right now. See how very good the faith preachers are at whipping people up into these emotional frenzies when they're expecting the miraculous and it's only then that miracles ever seem to take place have you ever wondered why it is that if god is really healing the sick through benny hen todd bentley some of these others why are they not in the hospitals you know i went to see benny hen in memphis tennessee a few years ago why didn't he almost literally cross the street and, and go to see go to saint jude and heal some of those sick kids with cancer, some of them dying. Why didn't he do that? The reason the faith preachers don't go to the hospitals is because they can't control the atmosphere in the hospitals. You see, miracles only seem to happen in a closed environment with dimmed lights, rhythmic music, rhythmic chanting when people are worked up into emotional frenzies. Then and only then do miracles ever seem to take place. The very first Benny Hinn crusade I attended was in Birmingham, Alabama in March of 2002. I was sitting next to an elderly woman who was in a wheelchair she had an oxygen tank strapped to the back of her chair and she had oxygen tubes up her nose. And I was talking with her daughter. Her daughter told me that her mother had severe emphysema and had been unable to walk without her oxygen for the last two years. Couldn't even take a step without her oxygen. And after Benny Hinn preached for a while, then it came time to take up the love offering. And the love offering was, is always collected just before the healing starts by design. And so once these buckets start going around, everybody knows what's coming next. And boy, you could just feel the excitement. I mean, there was just a buzz, and people knew what was coming. And I looked over, and this dear lady took the tube out of her nose, flipped it over the back of her head. She stood up out of her wheelchair, began to walk around. She said, I'm healed, I'm healed. Hadn't done this in two years. Some Benny Hinn staffers ran over to her, and they said, ma'am, tell us about your condition. She told them. She said, I'm healed. And they said, well, ma'am, do you want to go on stage and meet Pastor Benny? Yes, yes. So they began walking with her down to the front. And I just stayed where I was, and I just watched. And the further she walked, the slower she got. And she finally had to stop. And she motioned to her daughter. Her daughter rushed back, got the wheelchair, and then rushed it back up, put it behind her mother, and her mother just collapsed in the wheelchair, absolutely exhausted. Temporary emotional euphoria had subsided to physical reality. And that's the vast majority of cases of people claiming to be healed at Benny Hinn Crusades. If you'll notice, you'll never see anybody get up on stage in a Benny Hinn crusade that looks like me. Because I have a, a disability that can't be hidden. I can't do anything. You know, all these people that claim to be healed, they have some kind of illness that cannot be readily seen. Ringing in the ears, bad back, fibromyalgia, some very common cure, quote unquote, healed at Benny Hinn crusades. If God is really healing the sick through Benny Hinn, we should expect to see amputees grow new limbs. We should expect to see the severely mentally retarded restored but we don't you never see anything like that it's always somebody with an illness that cannot be readily seen to the best of my knowledge there has never been a single airtight case of anyone ever being healed at a Benny Hinn crusade to the best of my knowledge 
That having been said, however, I do not discount the possibility. Because let's play a little numbers game here. At any given Benny Hinn crusade, you've got about 20,000 people gathered. Let's just say 10% of those folks are there to be healed. And I'm sure the percentage is a lot higher than that. I've been to these meetings, but let's just say 10%. 2,000 people sick. Many of these folks love the Lord. And friends, just because someone follows a Benny Hinn or a Kenneth Copeland or one of these others doesn't mean they're a bad person. I mean, they, a lot of these folks love the Lord. They're just being led astray by wolves in sheep's clothing. But they're all praying to be healed. Believing as I do that God does still heal people today, I would expect some of these folks to be healed. Not because of Benny Hinn, but in spite of Benny Hinn. And what speaks such volumes to me is that there apparently are none. You figure at least 2,000 people every month, month after month after month for, for 20 years? Do the math, that's a lot of folks. And not one documented case? It's almost like God is going out of his way not to heal people at Benny Hinn Crusades. And if somebody were to come up to me and, who's sick and they tell me they're, they're thinking about going to Benny Hinn Crusade, my advice to, to them would say, no, don't do that. Don't go to Benny Hinn Crusade because your chances of getting healed are going to go down. It's almost like God's going out of his way not to. But could it have happened? Sure. I just haven't seen any evidence of it. Must have a sense of expectation. Another requirement to receive your healing from God, according to the faith preachers, show me the money. Today, you should give your biggest uh, cash bill or write your biggest check and send it in and then expect God to give to you. You can't out give Hallelujah. God. A thousand dollar vow of faith, big deal. We got people on welfare that's got enough faith to make a thousand dollar vow and paying it. And paying it. Heavy that he's into, he prophesies and he told me how he did. He said, right, I mean, he looked right across the table back and forth at me and, and, and he told me how, you know, how he confiscates money. He says he's on this station, it's over 40 states, and uh, he'll go on there and he'll be, get on the radio and he'll say, I know that listening to my little boys tonight, that there's some lady out there and you've got ten dollars put away in a cookie jar. Now God spoke to my heart and told me to go and tell you to get that ten dollars and get it in the mail and send it to me and God will bless you. God will give you a reward such as you've never known before. And then he comes back to me and tells me, he says, if you're on the radio and you're going over 40 states and you're on at prime time, you've got thousands of people listening, the chances are that there are at least two or three hundred little old ladies who've got a ten dollar bill in a cookie jar. And so if you even get, you know, a couple hundred go over and get it and send it to you, that's two grand that you've made just like that. And so, you know, if you're going to get into big time religion, this is the games you've got to play, things like that. It's a, it's a, you go into it as a business and you work it as a business, you know. Saints, this is why we need to give to the gospel now more than ever. You know, now you may say, well, I gave last year. Forget it, last year it's gone. That cycle is over with. Seed time harvest of last year is gone. Every season is a fresh season. We are in a fresh season. What, what you gave last year will not reap you anything this year. What you gave even a few months ago is gone. You got the harvest for that. When I talked with Dr. Roberts today and we talked about the seed faith thing, he said something awesome. He said, the Bible says giving and receiving, but he said, God has taught me by studying that word receiving that another way to say that word is receipting. The word receiving means receipting. And so he said, when you give, you get a receipt in heaven that when you have a need, you can then go with your receipt and say, you see, God, I have got my receipt from my sowing, and now I have a need, and I'm cashing in my receipt. I get asked a lot about Joyce Meyer, and that clip should be enough in and of itself to give anyone serious pause as they follow this woman's ministry. Joyce Meyer gets up and she says another way to say the word receiving is receipting. Paul Crouch said just before she said this Paul Crouch said we're not telling you that you can buy a miracle. Oh really? Well what do you call it Mr. Crouch? When Joyce Meyer gets up there and says another way to say the word receiving is receipting and when you have a need you give to God, you give to TBN that's sitting on cash reserves of over 300 million dollars or more and when you sow your seed, God will give you a receipt. So when you have a need, you go before God and you say, Here, God, here's my receipt. I'm cashing in my receipt. If that's not buying a miracle, then what is it? And stop and think about how many millions of people 
around the world watching that night and they're sick or they have a sick child and so they go to their checkbook and they write out a check for an amount of money they probably cannot afford because remember if you give it's got to be sacrificial because if you don't give sacrificially God's not going to honor that so you give sacrificially and then you send it in to these multi-millionaires thinking that God's going to cash in your receipt one day these false teachers will have to stand before a holy God and give an account for what they are doing to God's people. But precious people just keep calling and the Lord God is going to bless you beyond your expectations. Get ready. Pacific. And then send a gift. Here's why. The word of God says give and then the promise says and it shall be given. The word says so and then you shall reap you can't expect a harvest unless you've sown a seed see you can't expect a miracle till you've acted in faith towards that miracle coming your way so send that seed today whatever amount and really it depends on your need someone came to me in church recently and said well pastor <laughs> how much should i give to god i said what kind of har what kind of harvest are you looking for how much should i give to god well what kind of harvest are you looking for the not so subtle insinuation is is that if you have cancer or maybe you have a sick dying child you at best dig deeply because the bigger miracle you need the bigger monetary seed you better sow one day these false teachers will have to stand before a holy God and give an account for what they're doing to God's people the following rather astonishing admission from Gloria Copeland Brother Hagin's always taught us that healing is the dinner bell. Healing is the dinner bell. Healing is the dinner bell. I was really surprised when I heard Glory Copeland be so frank and honest. Healing is the dinner bell. Have you ever wondered how it is that these prosperity preachers can pack out 20, 30,000 seat coliseums night after night after night? Have you ever wondered how it is that they have such huge and devoted followings? You think people are flocking to these prosperity preachers to hear the gospel of repentance preached? No. Healing is the dinner bell. The faith preachers appeal to two of the most basic and universal of all human desires. Nobody enjoys being sick. And so they flock to these preachers. Not to serve the master, but to feast on what they are being told is on the master's table. Healing is the dinner bell. That's what gets people coming. You know, I couldn't pack out a 30,000 seat coliseum night after night after night. And Pastor Bob, I know you're a wonderful pastor, wonderful preacher, no offense, but neither could you. Because the gospel that your pastor and I preach doesn't promise people that if they'll come and give to our ministries, that God will make them wealthy and heal their bodies. There's not a great deal of money to be made in the true gospel if it's preached right. But there's a ton of money to be made in this gospel. Healing is the dinner bell. I want us to take a brief excursion from the norm and I want you to listen to an audio clip from a preacher that I actually very much admire and respect, the late Dr. Adrian Rogers. Now, I believe that God heals, and I want to make that abundantly clear. I believe that God heals people supernaturally. But friend, that cannot and should not be the focus of any ministry. If I had the power, and I am not a healer, but if I had the power to bring somebody down here in a wheelchair paraplegic, lay hands on that person, and that person would be instantaneously, miraculously, supernaturally healed, word would get out in this city next Sunday you couldn't put people in here with a shoehorn they would be here mister and I mean if I began to do that there would be people coming down here in great numbers I mean if it were real if it were authenticated they would be all over this place touch me heal me touch me heal me but you preach Jesus preach salvation preach repentance preach being broken oh no preach power give me this power as usual dr. Rogers is spot on target as usual it's always God's will to be healed. Are there any other requirements to receive your healing? Yes. According to the faith preachers, another requirement is you must have a right heart and you must persevere. Your heart must be right with God and you must persevere in your search for a miracle. This is what Benny Hinn told the Miracle Crusade audience in which I was in attendance in Birmingham, Alabama. Benny Hinn said, you cannot receive healing unless your heart is right with God. Healing is easily attained when your walk with God is right. Now stop and think just for a moment. Put yourself in the shoes of someone who was there and who was sick. 
with cancer or in a wheelchair or with a sick child. And when the show is over, they leave with the same cancer, they leave in the same wheelchair, they leave with the same sick child. Now not only do they have their illness with which to deal, now they also have to worry about their own spiritual deficiencies. That there's something wrong with their walk with the Lord just because they're sick. Just because they're sick. In light of a statement like this, that healing is so easily attained when your walk with God is right, have you ever wondered if Benny Hinn ever gets sick? Interesting question, is it not? Well, I found a couple of clips and maybe he can shed some light on this for us. Believe me when, believe me when I tell you, I never get sick. Crying, Do you know what, rejoicing. Do you know what happened to me one day, I'm going to tell you. I was as sick as a sick dog. With a, with a cold. Yeah, yeah, I get sick too. Yeah, that clears that up. <laughs> this from Gloria Copeland. So it's easy to be healed. And you can receive your healing anytime you're ready. Any of you can receive healing today anytime you're ready. You don't have to wait till the end of the service. You just take it and go with it. Glory to God. You can receive healing anytime you're ready for it. I find that statement very interesting, especially in light of the following email, which I received from her husband, Kenneth Copeland, just about three months after Gloria Copeland said this. Kenneth Copeland sent out an email to his followers, and he's, this is what he said. He said, much to my deep regret, I must postpone our meetings in Australia, Singapore, Korea, and Hawaii. A few days ago, I injured my back badly enough that even though my healing has already started, so many hours of flying would just be too much. Let's face it, I let this situation in my back go on too long. Now, wait a minute, Kenneth. Your wife just said you could receive healing anytime you're ready for it. And yet, Kenneth Copeland had to postpone three international and one domestic crusade because of his bad back. I wish ill on no one, not even Kenneth Copeland. But I do find it interesting that what the faith preachers preach doesn't seem to work for them. And if what the faith preachers preach doesn't work for them, that ought to be a clue to them. There just might be something wrong with what they're preaching. Why are they sick? Essek W. Kenyon, the grandfather of this movement, died from a tumor. Kenneth Hagen, father of the modern Word of Faith movement, died from heart disease. Oral Roberts wears eyeglasses, has heart problems and poor health. Fred Price's wife, recently treated for cancer. Jan Crouch, recently had cancer, gallbladder surgery. And Nora Lamb, the faith healer that I went to see as a teenager, had a massive stroke in 2003, died early the next year. Friends, the faith healers get sick just like us common folk do. And if what they're preaching doesn't work for them, that ought to be a clue to them. There just might be something wrong with what they're preaching. This is an interesting photograph that I came across. Jesse Duplantis, Benny Hinn, and John Hagee. Now, let me say something about John Hagee. I get asked a lot about him too. I don't necessarily put John Hagee in the same word of faith camp as Benny Hinn and Copeland and Duplantis and the others. I, I agree with a lot of what John Hagee preaches. I do, I disagree with a good bit of what he preaches too. He preaches prosperity, guaranteed healing, uh, has some rather unorthodox views of salvation of Jews and things like that. But uh, I don't necessarily call him word of faith. But he regularly associates with them. The thing that really troubles me is the people with whom he associates. He regularly associates with Benny Hinn, Kenneth Copeland, and he regularly has Jesse Duplantis come and preach for him in his pulpit. Jesse Duplantis is one of the worst of them. And as a pastor, who you have fill your pulpit says something about who you are and what you believe. And so I want to be fair to John Hagee, but I'll just offer you that bit of caution. But the real reason I want to show you this picture is not that John Hagee's in it. That's neither here nor there. I want you to look at the man in the middle, Benny Hinn. What's he got on his face? Oh, eyeglasses. Mr. Miracle himself has to wear eyeglasses. Physician heal thyself comes to mind. I wonder what's wrong with his walk with the Lord. You must have a right heart and you must persevere. This is what Benny Hinn wrote in his book, The Miracle of Healing. I remember a lady who went to Catherine Kuhlman's meetings 11 times before she was healed. 11 times. I asked one day, why did you keep coming back? She said, because I knew. I knew my day was coming and I was going to go back until God healed me. I was not giving up. The reason many do not get healed is because they give up so quickly. I attended a Benny Hinn crusade in Dallas, Texas, June of 2002. And I was sitting next to a man who was in a wheelchair. At the time, he was 32 years of age, in a wheelchair. His, all four of his limbs had to be strapped down because of extreme spasticity in his muscles and ligaments. Even his head had to be strapped back to the headrest behind him to hold his head up. He was wearing a bib because he's constantly drooling on himself. 
his eyes were rolled back in their sockets. And I was talking with his mother who was there with him. And uh, his mother told me that her son had the mind of an infant. He was a vegetable. And just in casual conversation, I asked her where they were from. She said, New Hampshire. Friends, we were in Dallas. I said, ma'am, did you drive your son all the way down here from New Hampshire to see Benny Hinn? She said, oh yes. We follow Benny Hinn all over the country. Can you imagine what that poor woman must go through, lugging her incapacitated son, who was bigger than she was, all over the country, hoping this will be the time, this will be the time, this will be the time, and it never is. Oh, it's no skin off Benny Hinn's back. No, he just takes their love offering, and he goes home to his $10 million parsonage overlooking the Pacific Ocean and leaves all these poor people behind to pick up the shattered pieces of their lives. One day, these false teachers will have to stand before a holy God and give an account for what they are doing to God's people. If it is always God's will to be healed and your healing does not come, are there reasons for that? Yes, according to word faith theology, nothing will make you lose your miracle of healing more quickly than your lack of faith. You must have enough faith. This from Benny Hinn, and it might surprise you. You know, isn't it, when it, it's so cruel to tell people, well, you're sick because you have no faith. That's so cruel. Yes. No, no, it's not, it's not our faith. It's his mercy. Yes. It's his grace. Isn't that right? Yes. You know what? He's right. He's absolutely right. But unfortunately, that is not, uh, that is not typical of what he preaches, in fact, not at all. The following is more like what he really teaches. My friend, hear this well. The reason people lose their healing is because they begin questioning if God really did it. We receive it by faith. We keep it by faith. Say by faith. Hind and touched his garment. Now, before she touched, verse 1 to 8 says, for she said, for she said, for she said, say that with me. In other words, she knew. She knew that she knew that she knew she's going to get a miracle. First key, she heard. Second key, she came. Third key, she knew. When you know, you're on the way. But if you sit there and say, I'm not sure, you just lost it. What does laying your hands on a human have to do with healing? Well, really nothing. We touch people all the time, they feel sick. What he's looking for is permission. The power to heal is always present. But having permission to heal is held up by humanity and their lack of faith. <laughs> Hallelujah. Having permission to heal is held up by humanity and their lack of faith. Is faith required for us to receive healing from God? Well, it's not a very easy question to answer. Because there is at least one occasion in which, in which Jesus appeared to be hindered from what he wanted to do for people because of their lack of faith. However, there are other occasions in which Jesus healed people, and there's apparently no faith at all required on the part of the person being healed. The man born blind in John chapter 9, Jesus healed him, but that man didn't have faith in Jesus, didn't even know who he was. Gerizim demoniac, Mark chapter 5, Jesus healed him, but that man didn't have faith in Christ, he was demon-possessed. So it's not a very easy question to answer, but... If faith is required for us to receive healing from God, I think the question that needs to be asked is this. What kind of faith is required? Now, the faith preachers say you have to have the kind of faith that says, God, I know that it is your will to heal me. I know you're going to do it. I'm ready to receive it. I'm expecting it. Have at it. Is that the kind of faith for which Jesus asked? It doesn't appear to be, at least not in the context of physical healing. Let's look at Matthew chapter 9. As Jesus went on from there, two blind men followed him, crying out, Thou son of David, have mercy on us. When he entered the house, the blind men came up to him, and Jesus said to them, Believe ye that I am able to do this? They said unto him, Yes, Lord. Then he touched their eyes, saying, According to your faith, be it done unto you. Notice the question that our Savior asked these men. Did he say, Do you believe that I will do this? No. He said, Do you believe I am able to do this? Literally in the Greek, Jesus said, do you believe I have enough dunamis? Do you believe I have enough power to do this? They said, yes. And then he said, according to your faith, according to that kind of faith, be it done unto you. Dear friend, I 
I have all the faith in the world that Jesus is able to heal me of my cerebral palsy. He created me. He can heal me. Jesus would not break a sweat healing me of my CP. But to save me, he had to die. Dear friend, if you are here today and you know Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, you've been born again, don't let anybody tell you that you don't have enough faith to be healed. If you've got enough faith to be saved, you have certainly got enough faith to be healed. If Jesus were to heal me right now of my CP, and I were to drop my crutches and leap off of this stage, be completely whole, never to pick my crutches up again, that would be a pretty incredible miracle. Who knows, maybe even make the papers. But as incredible a miracle as that would be, dear friends, that miracle would pale in comparison to what God did for me when he saved me from my sins. That is the greatest miracle of all. If you've got enough faith to be saved, rejoice, my brother. Rejoice, my sister in Christ. You have certainly got enough faith to be healed. And don't let anybody tell you anything different. According to the faith preachers, are you not healed? Well, maybe you're not even saved. This is what Benny Hinn said on TVN. He said, when Israel came out of Egypt, God performed an incredible miracle, and that is when he healed all of Israel. The Israelites were all healed when they ate the Passover. When people are saved, they ought to be healed at the same time. The Bible says when he brought them out. The reason so many are not healed, they're not out yet. They're not saved. This from Benny Hinn. Now ladies and gentlemen, hear this very clearly please and never forget. It's as easy to get healed as it is to get forgiven. It's as easy to receive physical healing as it is to receive forgiveness for sin. It's just as easy to get healed. Healing is as easy as salvation. Do not complicate what is simple. Say it with me, it's as easy to get healed as it is to get forgiven. Healing should never be separate from salvation. Healing should never be separate from salvation. I invite you again to stop and think and put yourself in the shoes of someone who's there, who's sick, with cancer, in a wheelchair, with a sick child. And when the show is over, they leave with the same cancer, the same wheelchair, the same sick child. Now not only do they have their illness with which to deal, now they have to worry that they're not even saved. Friends, I've been to the Benny Hinn Crusades. I've been to eight of them. And I've seen what the television cameras won't show you. That on the floor in the back are dozens and dozens and dozens of sick people in wheelchairs. I've seen people lying on the floor so sick with cancer they cannot even lift their heads. I've seen people on stretchers. I've seen parents cradling vegetative children in their arms, dying babies in their arms. Tubes coming out of these precious little babies' noses, mouths tears streaming down their faces, praying that God would heal their child. And then they hear a statement like that from that false prophet. Now not only do they have their illness with which to deal, now they have to worry they're not even saved. Friends, sometimes a man or woman has good reason to doubt his or her salvation. If there's never been a change in your life, if you don't hate sin, if you don't love the Lord, love the Word, if you don't love the brethren, those are good reasons to doubt your salvation. But being sick is not one of them. Being sick is not one of them. The faith preachers take the Word of God, and instead of it serving as a source of strength and encouragement to the afflicted believer, they take God's Word, they wrench it out of its context, turn it on its head, so now it stands in judgment over them. And I cannot imagine a more self-serving perversion of God's Word than what the faith preachers do with it. And to top it all off, they take their money. We have one final video clip today, and I want to set this clip up for you a little bit before I show it. This clip is going to begin with a few short, assor assorted clips of Gloria Copeland, and then the clip is going to move to a man named Garwin Dobbins. Garwin Dobbins is one of the most beautiful examples of anyone I've ever seen. Uh, who suffers from a disease the likes of which I dare say no one in this room including myself could even begin to imagine and through unimaginable suffering 
He loves the Lord and serves Him faithfully. And I want you to notice the contrast between a wolf in sheep's clothing and a real man of God. That's a tradition that God is glorified when you're sick. Well now, if you'll just think about it a minute, it would be very difficult for God to be glorified through you when you're sick. It is nonsense to say that sickness and disease works for good. It's a slander to talk evil about God. When he is totally good to say that it's God's will for you to be sick or he's the one that made you sick, that is pitiful. Or he's doing that to teach you something. You don't hear those things as much as you used to, I don't guess. I mean, I don't, I don't know. I don't, I don't go where you could hear them, so I don't know. You probably, they're still out there, imagine. But if it was true that you learned through pain and suffering, we could just knock every little kid in the head before he went to school every morning <laughs> and see how he did that day. He'd come dragging in, his eyes rolling around, and, well, tell me what you learned today. I didn't learn anything. My head just hurt me all day long. That's about how stupid that is. So that God puts, here's the, here's the doctrine that, that, uh, that people get hung up on. God gets glory from sickness and disease. Now that is, that just sounds so ridiculous to me now. I've heard the truth for so long. Because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God and to them who are called according to his purpose. So traditional doctrine takes that, verse 28, doesn't look what's around it or what's behind it. And they say, well, you know, you know, all things work together for good. Here, you've just had a car wreck, your legs are broken, your head's all bandaged up, and somebody comes on with the, in with the comforting words, you know, all things work together for those that love God. And you say, uh-huh, yeah, yeah, that's right. I should have thought of that. Does that make any sense at all? No, it is not Bible that God gets glory from your sickness and disease. And one of them is a gentleman named Darwin Dobbins, and he's here. Would you all welcome Darwin right here? Darwin Dobbins. Darwin, we love you. And this season wouldn't be appropriate for us to tell of the goodness of the Lord if, if you weren't here helping us. Darwin, I want you to talk right in the mic. Tell us, let me see if I can get this disease right, because it's big, long, a lot of vowels and consonants. Myositis osophagans yes. progressiva. Right. Did I get all that right? You got it. There's only how many people in the world ever had this? As of right now, there's supposed to be 350 known cases. All right. Tell us what this disease actually does just in a short amount of time, what it does to the person. It makes your muscle turn to bone, and it, uh, when it starts, it feels like two different people is twisting the inner core of your bone. and. Uh, putting it over an open flame. You know what's uh, uh, what I admire about you so much is with this debilitating disease that you have is your spirit. You have the spirit of a champion. And in this uh, autumn time of Thanksgiving, is it possible to have something like this in your life and yet remain thankful? Oh, yes. Tell us, how, how are you thankful in times like these? I'm very thankful for, for life, for health, for eyes. When I see... <laughs> that there's people that's worse off than this. There's people that don't have legs, don't have ears, don't have a healthy mind, or cannot have a sense of smell. And when I look about and see the color that God has spangled the sky with in the, in the rainbow, and when he put the stars in the sky, I know that he cares for me. Yeah. Now, you sing a song that we're going to do right now. If the Lord doesn't choose to heal you on this earth, there will be a time shortly when you will be healed. In your mind, what do you see yourself doing when this body has been exchanged for your new body? What do you see yourself doing? If we're going to run on streets of gold. And uh, number one person I want to meet is David because he has been a strength to me over the years and uh, I want to be as close to him like him in praise and worship wow isn't that incredible that he would uh, you know a lot of people might be bitter or angry at God and yet he remains a person of praise there's never been anybody I've ever met that is more encouraging than Garland 
Darwin, you sing a song called I Can Only Imagine. Can we help you? Yes. But you just want to do this by yourself? No, I want you to. Okay, all right. Let's, uh, let's uh, stand you up here. Undo his, undo his seat belt. Watch for the airbags and all the... Here we go. I can only imagine. I can only imagine when that day comes and I walk by your side. I can only imagine what my eyes will see when your face is before me. I can only imagine. I can only imagine. Surrounded by your glory, what will my heart feel? Will I dance for you, Jesus, or in all of you be still? Will I stand in your presence, or to my knees will I fall? Will I sing hallelujah? Will I be able to speak at all? I can only imagine. I can only imagine. I can only imagine when that day comes when I find myself standing in the sun. I can only imagine when all I will do is forever, forever worship. I can only imagine. I can only imagine. Surrounded by your glory, what will my heart feel? Will I dance for you, Jesus? Only Lord, you be still. Will I stand in your presence? Or to my knees will I fall? Will I sing hallelujah? Will I be able to speak at all? No need to do this. I can only imagine. Surrounded by your glory, what will my heart feel? Will I dance for you, Jesus, or in all of you be still? Will I stand in your presence, or to my knees will I fall? Will I sing hallelujah, will I be able to speak at all? It's not Bible that God gets glory from your sickness and disease. Healing should never be separate from salvation. I can only imagine. I can only imagine. I can only imagine. Darwin no longer has to imagine. He's gone on to be with the Lord. Faith made sight. The Apostle Paul writes, Concerning this thorn, I entreated the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for power is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses, that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Praise be his name. Praise be his name. Dear friend, if you are here today and you have a sickness or disease or you have a loved one who does, my first word of encouragement to you would be that you go to the Lord. You go to his throne of grace and ask him to heal you. And I will pray with you that he does. But if he doesn't, 
know that sometimes there is something better than being physically healed. And that is knowing His sufficient grace. That is knowing His strength made perfect in our weaknesses. Praise be His name. As we conclude today, I want to ask you this question. Do you know the one who gives His sufficient grace? Do you know the one who gives His strength made perfect in weakness? Friends, do you know the one who has made provision for your sin? Has there ever been a time in your life when you have been convicted by God's Holy Spirit that you are a sinner, that you have broken the laws of God? You've lied. You've stolen something. You've looked with lust and committed adultery in your heart. You've used the Lord's name in vain, committed blasphemy. Has there ever been a time when you've been convicted by God's Holy Spirit through His Word that you've broken God's laws? And because you have broken the laws of God, God's wrath abides on you. Has there ever been a time in your life, dear one, when you have been convicted by God's Holy Spirit of the truth of the gospel, that Jesus was pre-existent with the Father, that he came to this earth fully God and yet fully man, and lived a sinless, perfect life on this earth, and willingly laid down his life on the cross and bore the wrath of God so that you and I don't have to. Have you been convicted in your heart of the truth that Jesus on the third day was raised from the dead and one day is coming again? Dear friend, I'm not asking you if you are a member of this church or some other church. I'm not asking you if you've walked the aisle. I'm not asking you if you've been baptized. I'm not asking you if you've prayed the sinner's prayer, which isn't found in Scripture. I'm asking you, have you ever been convicted of sins? Have you ever repented of your sins? and place all of your trust in the risen Lord Jesus, in Him alone, for His salvation. Dear friends, that is the greatest healing of all, knowing Christ as Savior and Lord. Let us close in a word of prayer. Lord Jesus, we love you and we praise you. We thank you for your sufficient grace. We thank you for your strength made perfect in our weaknesses. We thank you that you have made provision for our sins, that you came and you bore the wrath of God on, on that cross so that we won't have to. Father, I pray that if there is anyone here today or maybe someone listening to me through the video later, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would convict them of the truth of your word, that convict them of their sin, convict them of your wrath, righteousness, judgment, but also, Lord, that you would convict them of your love for them, that you would convict them of the truth of the gospel, if they will turn from their sins and place all of their faith and trust in you, you will save them. The wrath of God will be removed. You will have all of eternity to live in perfect fellowship with you. These things we ask and pray in Jesus' name, for his sake. Amen.